hopefully I am live. If I'm not, please let me know. Well, actually, that's a pretty stupid thing to ask. Uh, please let me know if I am live and sounds good and all that sort of stuff. Um, oh, I see Jay has just joined. Thank you for joining. I'm glad I, uh, I haven't uh, disrupted your dinner. Um, and uh, I am using a different microphone this time. I'm using a um, uh, lapel microphone, so I'm hoping the sound might be a bit better. Um, uh, as in, the, the mic hurts my ears. Is it like, I like audio very oversteered though. Okay, what if I were to do say, just bear with me a moment. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go like this that down a smidge how does uh, how does is that any better um, peaking too high I guess okay um, uh, so I've just dropped the uh, the input volume of that mic so uh, I'm hoping that it might be a little bit happier so please let me know if that's oh good 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 I've got a much better much better much better lots of oh too low now oh my goodness oh my goodness I'm going to go up a little bit. Just there we go. I'm finding it immediate. Okay, right. So I have just I have just set it at a particular volume, and I would, um, and I'm going to keep it at that. If people are having trouble hearing me, or if it's too loud, and uh, now it dipped too low. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Um, all right. It's all good now. I've got I've got three thumbs up from Steve. So. All right, so let's just let's just go with that for the moment, um, and uh, and then we'll uh, yeah we'll worry about uh, that. If if it sort of gets uh, if it gets a bit too quiet or too noisy, just let me know. I can make little adjustments here and there. Okay, so um, very quickly, uh, Macintosh, Macintosh SE thirty. Just say a couple of things about it very quickly. Um, uh, released in uh, beginning of nineteen eighty nine. 68030 CPU, 16 megahertz, uh, virtually the Mac 2X inside a compact case has become a really collectible um, Mac, mainly because it's got eight um, RAM slots, which means you can stick eight 16 megabyte SIMs in it and take it all the way up to 128 megabytes. Now that probably would have cost an absolute mint at the time, I hate to think what 128 megabytes of RAM would have cost in like 1989, 1990, but uh, these days, uh, getting 128 megabytes of RAM in these is is, um, is pretty cheap. And of course, you know, you um, um, uh, you know, it's a very small amount compared to these days. But if you have like System Seven or even System Six running on this, you can do a lot uh, with 128 megabytes of RAM. Sort of, uh, you know, sky's the limit. Um, the other thing, of course, the SE30 had was uh, an expansion slot on it, the uh, SE PDS slot, so you could stick network cards in it and display cards. And I mean, I remember when I used to work in a design studio, we had lots of these, and um, and we with often with a lot of them, we often had like full page displays attached to them and stuff like that. Now, the really interesting thing about this particular SE30, and I'm going to just see if I can get this camera down a little bit, is this here. Um, now, this is a little Rasterops display port out here. Um, and this is really interesting because this particular model was available for sale on eBay here in Australia and I very nearly bought it. Um, and I very nearly bought it because of that port because I knew um, that often those display cards can be worth than the, more than the Macs themselves and I've always wanted to have one. Um, I contacted the seller and I said, hey, I notice a Rastrops port on the back. Is that, um, is that indicative of what's inside it? Does it actually have a Rastrops display card inside? And he responded with, I know nothing about these things. I have no idea, no clue, selling it as it is. So I thought, well, look, if it, if it, it goes cheap, I'll grab it. Uh, I set myself a limit of $150 and it sold for a, just a little over $160, so I didn't buy it. Now, I probably should have bought it, but, you know, whatever. But anyhow, as it turned out, if I had bought it, I would have been uh, sniping one of my customers. So, you know, probably worked out well in the end. Right, that's enough of me garbling. So I'm going to open this up um, and we're going to have a look inside. Uh, if anyone has any questions at any stage of this process please 
please uh, just jump in and say stuff. Um, uh, oh, hey, Dana. Um, okay, so uh, first things first, this has got to come off. Uh, anyone who ever opens an SE30, if they've got one of these, that has got to come off. It's got little plastic prongs poking in. And if you, um, if you uh, open it up with that in there, those plastic prongs will bend or break. Now, unfortunately, someone has already done that. And where you see one prong here, there should, one bent prong here, there should actually be two. So regrettably, someone didn't heed the warning I just gave when they opened this up at some stage. Uh, this one has the four Torx screws holding it in, two inside the handle, two at the bottom here. Um, so uh, anyone who ever owns any of these Macs, grab yourself a, um, a, a, an extra long Torx driver. Um, they're not particularly expensive and I went for literally decades with this kind of little tiny one that I could just get in the, in the holes of the handle and I just should have bought this years ago. Um, so anyhow, I'll take these off very quickly and then I'll have a quick look at these comments just to see if there's anything I need to check. Uh -huh. Oh, wow, I've never seen an SC with the interrupt reset buttons. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I'm pretty sure they all came with them, but uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'm doing the four screw. If you were doing a Mac Plus or a 128K or um, a, uh, a 512K, there'd be another screw to undo under the battery cover, but uh, not with the SC and SE 30s, only the four screws. So, um, Next thing to do is open this up. Now, um, I've I've watched people people um, uh, struggle with opening these up, and uh, yeah, obviously the one thing you don't want to do is use a screwdriver, and that has been done here. There are actually these little ding marks in here. Sorry about the microphone. Little ding ding marks just in here, and uh, and that's a, that's a shame, you know, because once you put a screwdriver in there, you just give it a twist, and then the next you know you've bent the plastic. Uh, if, you, if you've got a case cracker, a genuine Apple case, case cracker, that's awesome. Um, but these do actually work reasonably well if you have to. If you, uh, if you just get the, the little bits and you put them in here and then you give them a squeeze, they'll open it up. But having said that, um, with most of them, I just open them with a little bit of, a, little bit of a, a, a pull. So I usually just get one hand here, big flat sort of surface area there, my fingers here, and then I just pull apart like that. And I'm really sorry how easy I made that look, Steve, but if it's any consolation, um, the SE30 is a hell of a lot easier to open up than the Classic. So, off she comes, there's the case. No signatures inside this one, so, you know, don't get excited. Now, I am about to reveal the secret that this computer has, and it's a rather sad one. Um, and that is that this particular port that I referred to, the uh, display port, card port, goes to nothing. So uh, no card in here at all. Now we have, on the last Mac Yak show had a little bit of a discussion about sort of protecting yourself when it comes to eBay sales. And of course there is a lesson to be learned here that if you contact a seller and ask them a question, a direct question about the product and they can't answer it, um, you know, you really can't make assumptions as to whether the seller was actually being deliberately deceptive or they genuinely did not, not know, I have no idea. But at some stage, someone has removed that card and uh, left the little, um, you know, port on the outside. Card's pretty useless without the port, but you know. And so unfortunately, the guy who bought this didn't end up with that graphics card. But having said that, um, uh, it was still a pretty good price for an SE30, so there. Um, all right, so, oh, there you go. Uh, I saw the Rastrop's card online pretty cheap without the cable in case you can snag the VGA port for yourself and use it on your SE. <laughs> yes, no, I mean, if it is around, I think I'd probably let this guy know because he was the one that wanted it. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think he'd be too thrilled if I stole the port from his computer. Um, so, okay, so next thing we need to do in order to get the card out Oh, well, I really should discharge this, shouldn't I? I mean, I go on about it all the time. Um, the, I have a video in my, in my channel about uh, discharging the CRT 
on these things here um, and uh, even though this hasn't been turned on for I think days, possibly even weeks, uh, I am just gonna go through the process anyway, but um, it's uh, this one really isn't much of a risk here uh, because it has been left off for so long, all of that stuff will have discharged. But I have my discharging tool here, which looks suspiciously like a Stanley screw screwdriver with a, um, a, a red wire coming off it to a little, uh, well, they're called alligator clip, but I think in Australia we have to call them a croc clip, don't we? So, and then I actually have a metal uh, shelving system here, which I use uh, as ground. So I just connect it to that rather than connecting it to something on the computer. Um, uh, document the rash drops, pin out of that cable when you can, the, that way people with the port, without the port, that's a very good, uh, a very good suggestion. I will do that um, so that, uh, yeah, so that if someone does uh, come across a card, they'll know how to, oh my goodness, that network of wires looks like a nightmare. That's not going to be fun to document. Anyhow, um, so, um, uh, not following all of the guidance from my video, I am not going to take off my jewellery, I'm not going to put one hand behind my back, I'm just going to do this, as I say, I know that it has no power, but I'll do it anyway, that under there, touch the, uh, the little um, anodes under there, discharge, all discharge, safe to touch now. So, um, uh, do you have the chassis grounded to that bar in the wall? That bar in the wall, that, which bar in the wall? I'm not sure. I've actually got, um, I actually have this grounded to uh, a great big chunk of metal over here, so. Uh, Mr. McIntosh, hello. Thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. Um, and, okay, so the first thing I'm going to do now, well, it's not the first thing, is it? It's like about the fourth or fifth or something. Anyway, I'm now going to take off the anode cap, and I'm going to do that by sort of pushing it sideways until one of the pins comes out and then pulling it the other way and there we have our, we've got our two little two little pins in the uh, anode cap there and in the spider's web and then <laughs> no it's fine um okay so um i'm gonna take off incidentally i don't actually need to remove that but i just thought i'd demonstrate it put it back in there um take off the shield shield comes off um, I would generally recommend if anyone is ever doing work around inside these to undo this thing here. This undoes with a, a couple of screws, one there and a couple there and there. And that comes off and it just gives you a little bit of better access into that part of the computer. That's sort of a little bit restrictive having that there. So if you are doing work inside. Um, okay, so to get this out, uh, the first thing we do is disconnect the SCSI cables, and I've already done that. I probably should have left them in, but um, the SCSI cables just connect uh, at the bottom of the board here. I don't even know if there's going to be any way I can show that, but anyhow, the SCSI cables connect there. I'll show you where they are on the board when I take it out. Once you have disconnected the SCSI and the floppy cable, the board lifts up like this. And it lifts up, you can see down this side, there are little slots in the board that match up with these metal slots here. I hope you can see. Um, so I lift this up until that slot matches like that. Now you can see that the slot, other side, the slot in the board matches this, this little metal slot. And that will allow for this side to just pop out. It will, it will, but I'll need to come at it from a different angle because it's kind of hard to do it at that angle. So that pops out like that. Now the board is still not ready to come out because it's still connected with the power cable and uh, the speaker cable. But uh, I've found from my experience, the best way to get to that speaker cable is to actually release this board, just to have a little bit of a gap in there, to then squeeze your hand in here and, um, and you can push, the, the, the plug has a little clip on it and you can push the clip while you're pulling at the board to then release the cable. So I'm gonna do that now. I think I have to do it, I'm trying to do it at an angle that works for me, but it's not very good to look at. So I've got my hand in here. I've got one finger pushing up on that little clip, and then I'm going to just gently coax that board away like that. And then the speaker cable 
which is connected here that just comes out like that so there is our logic board removed let, let me get this big crt out of the way and not damage it because it's not mine uh, there we go oh, yeah go the uh, lapel mic picks up those grunting noise as well doesn't it um okay so just going to check very quickly on this chat to make sure that i haven't missed anything uh, okay good no worries just checking to make sure there weren't any uh, any questions uh hovering around there for me to answer okay so that's that's kind of the the annoying part of getting the uh, logic board out but once it's out we're all you know it's all fairly easy from here on in we've got uh, on this board i'll try and get a little bit closer here we've obviously got the spawn of satan here which is a pram battery which we are going to remove for obvious reasons because they do explode and do ugly things to boards this is one of the earlier revisions of the uh of the board which uh has this socketed 68030 CPU. Uh, the later ones actually had it soldered directly onto the board. And this one also has down here, you may not be able to see it, but a little snaking blue bodge wire. Uh, and once again, that was taken out in a later revision of this board. But this is the early one that has this little blue bodge wire. Uh, most of the stuff around here is all related to video, all this sort of stuff around here. Um, and often what happens is these capacitors up here uh, they leak and this one in particular leak down onto this chip here which is i think ue8 i'm not i can't see it this from this way but um and that causes problems with the video then you also have up here um on this side again two sound chips and these little capacitors here tend to leak and stop the sound from working as well so they're the kind of known problems with these. And then of course we have the well-known just general SEMA uh, CMAC, um, you know, sort of uh, situation where you get things like, you know, checkered screens and funny little patterns on screens and stuff like that. Um, this one has uh, eight one meg, I would pre I'm pretty sure they're one megabyte SIMs, eight one megabyte SIMs. So it's loaded up with eight megabytes of RAM. And so it has been upgraded because this didn't come with eight. This originally came with, I think one or two. So. Uh, and that there uh, is, that is not a cash card, that is a ROM SIM. Um, the SE30 had an actual ROM SIM, and I think you can get, um, from Big Mess of Wires, I think you can get new ROMs with these, and the ROMs actually, you can actually boot from them and stuff like that. So, um, um, so yeah, anyhow, this one has, this one has eight megabytes of RAM, uh, there's the ROM SIM, and of course the big killer with these is that they have the plastic clips uh, holding these RAM SIMs in. So you've got to be ultra careful getting these out because that plastic just breaks so easily. I had someone send me one of these boards once and they wrapped it all up, uh, but they didn't wrap it particularly well and the box got hit and it just pushed this ROM SIM and just snapped one of the sides. Now when that happens, what you can do is you can just get a bit of hot glue from hot glue gun to hold it in. And then if you ever need to remove it, hot glue just clips off, you know, it's nice and easy. So that's generally what I recommend. Um, so uh, what I am going to do is try and point this camera down a smidge so that I can just uh, go through the process of getting this RAM out. Um, I use my trusty scalpel, um, you know, and I just sort of, I generally slip it down one side and just gently pry apart the, uh, a little bit of plastic and then I do it on the other side and pop it out and it's like it's really nerve-wracking to do because I think I might just use my fingernail yeah this this one this one's not too bad this one still feels fairly good but the RAM's got to come off because I'm going to be applying heat to this I'm going to be washing it um, you know it's got to uh, it's got to be uh, the ramp's got to be off there so uh, i need to make sure that when i put this in the cleaner all those little pins on the ram slots all get washed as well uh, incidentally anyone who was wa watching my earlier stream my stream from a few days ago where i recapped an lc3 uh, it was a little bit of a fizz because at the end when i started it up i got the uh, sad mac chime i um 
I put that straight into the ultrasonic cleaner and after it had been dried and tested, it worked. So it was, uh, it was just residual gunge that was stopping that one from working. It wasn't actually a damaged trace or anything. So, um, okay, um, just having a look here. Taking uh, is Okay, so they all came out without breaking. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty happy and so did that one. So there's our, there's our ROM sim there. Um, it's quite funny because sometimes when people send me these, they send them without the ROM sim. So there's just that assumption that I'm going to have one because I can't test them without it. So that board is pretty much ready to go. Now, just before I change the camera back up, um, I'll just show you. I don't know how well you're going to see it or how well it's going to focus, probably badly. These caps here, they're pointing up at an angle and that's not a good thing. That's generally not what you want from them. So. Um, it's a good job that we're recapping it. It's, the board is actually in incredibly good condition. I mean, it's really clean. And we'll have a look under the microscope in a sec. But um, yeah, it's, um, um, it's, I think this one's going to be a pretty easy recapping job. So let's stop looking at my hunky chest and back to my pretty face. There we go. I think I'm, yeah, that's more enough. Yeah, see, we don't need to see too much. Um, all right. So let's now jump across to the microscope and stare at blurriness. So I'm going to start off at uh, start off at those caps I was referring to before. Um, and these ones are the ones here that are at a bit of a wonky angle. Um, just check and make sure that I've got them in focus because for my li live stream, more of that was out of focus than in focus. So. Um, now, uh, once again, I sort of mentioned in my previous stream that when you are doing um, uh, doing a recap, in particular, if you're planning to do your, your own, your, your very first recap yourself, um, you need to practice on something that is not an, a, an important board. I mean, you know, practice on anything, you know, a sort of, a, you know, a broken poster or something like that, you know, something with some circuitry on it play around with a soldering iron, get used to it. Um, because if you start your very first one on a computer that you are, uh, you know, that you, you really don't want to damage, it can, yeah, practice on a PC. That's a really good suggestion. Um, uh, hang on, I just put the code list back up on my page. Oh, okay, no worries, yes. Um, I just got a little message there from Jay about something we were discussing earlier. Um, he's, uh, he's dirtying himself with, with Google. Um, so, uh, when it comes to, if we have a look at these, I'll just zoom in very quickly. If we look here at the, um, the little pins here, the little pads with the solder on it, you see that they're, they're actually quite uh, crusty. Well, if I go onto this one on the right where I can actually get my hand in there, you can see they're actually quite sort of gunky and crusty. If I scrape at that a bit, it will reveal solder underneath it but they've ended up with a lot of gunk on top of them. Um, and the big, um, the big um, sort of problem with those gunky ones is they're very difficult to get that solder to behave well, to behave the way solder would normally. Um, and I, in my videos, have talked about um, removing uh, capacitors without a, um, without a hot air station. And I've said that one of the things you can do is you can get some flux. Incidentally, down in the uh, description of the video, you'll find links to pretty much everything I use here. If you don't find what you're looking for, feel free to ask me. Um, but um, uh, flux is an incredibly important thing. I've mentioned this before. Flux is uh, uh, involved in stopping the oxidization or oxidation process of the solder. It helps it sort of flow and it helps it actually attach to things you want it to attach to. Um, now, if I was to remove this capacitor without a hot air station, I would go through this particular process. I would start off by, I, I mean, I just scraped that, that, um, that clean a little bit, and I did that to try and make it so that new solder would uh, join in with the old solder. I'm gonna add some flux here. I'm gonna grab my trusty soldering iron as I've mentioned before, I use, uh, oh, geez, got the wrong, got the wrong tip on that. Sorry about that. Need my, 
my bigger tip. That's my little fine tip. <laughs> um, once again, using a uh, Hacko uh, FX951 soldering station. Uh, you don't have to use the same one. These are a good soldering station. I'm happy with them. Apart from the interface, which is just junk. Uh, it has a key for changing the temperature. I mean, why do you need a key for changing the temperature? Are people buying these and giving them to someone and saying, hey, I want you soldering and I want you changing the temperature? It's just stupid. But anyhow, um, so uh, is that, oh, is that, uh, that a yes, yes, that is indeed uh, that question about is this a really bad trace? It is. It is a bad trace right here. It's an absolute shocker. Um, I will probably just start here to see whether we've got copper underneath it. And we do appear to have copper underneath it. Um, I'm sort of scraping all this black gunk off because I don't want to leave the trace like that because it is likely to just get worse and worse and worse. I will scrape all the black stuff off and then I will um, put new uh, UV solder mask on top of it. Um, I've talked about this before with my scraping. I use uh, surgical scalpels, uh, little Swan Morton uh, surgical scalpels with a curved blade. Um, you know, if you can get hold of them uh, nice and cheap, they're really good for scraping. Um, oh yes, and, and of course, this is the other real problem is anytime you're working with a computer, see this is, I, I, I got ahead of myself when I said this board looked really clean, didn't I? Um, I mean, look at this. Yeah, this scunch here. Yum. And actual fact, look at that. That that looks like it might have even blown. Um, I don't think that pad's there anymore. Uh, right there. That is a no pad situation. Now, what you've got here, incidentally, for anyone who's playing along at home, uh, this is one of the uh, serial port chips. So this is for the... Um, there's two of them. Two, one mixed with the other, uh, one for each RS-232 uh, serial port on the back. So um, there is, I'd say, a fairly good chance that the serial ports, uh, one of those serial ports doesn't work. Now, if this chip is fried and I need to replace it, it's okay, I do have another one. Um, and I, well, I've got spares that I can use. A lot, of the, a lot of the models of computer, I think the classic might have even used the same chip. So there's plenty of, um, you know, uh, plenty of replacements to be found if you've got some old, old boards lying around. So yeah, that was, uh, that's a shocker. Thank you for spotting that. Um, I'm too busy um, sort of worrying about capacitors and we've got bigger fish to fry, haven't we? But anyhow, so taking this one off without a hot air station, I'm just going to do it with this. I'm going to use hot air for the rest because it's a lot easier. And there really is no excuse to not have a hot air station. Um, as the, uh, the fellow Mac Yakers, who are all using the same machine, uh, have said it is, um, you can get like for $48, one that's a soldering iron and a hot air station in one and uh and you can get different tips for them as well so you know no excuse to uh to not have a, a fairly decent soldering station now i use a quick 861 dw hot air station uh and this is this is the end of it here now uh, again there are links to this in the uh, in the description but what i really like about this one uh is that this has the fan because obviously a hot air station blows out really hot air so in here you have a heating element and then it blows hair, hair it blows air past that heating element and shoots out super hot air. Um, and the, um, the, the air, the actual, like the fan for blowing the air is in the base station and it blows air through this big thick pipe here. Um, and the advantage of this is that it can actually blow much more powerful air because it can put a much bigger fan in the base station. Whereas the cheaper ones, they actually have the fan in the handle themselves. And so there's a limit to how much hot air they can blow out. But those cheap ones are better than none at all. I will say that for absolute certain. Um, okay. Oh, uh, did you hear a parrot? No, that was a raven. That was uh, one of our Australian ravens um, making a little bit of a noise out there. Um, Okay, so uh, okay, so anyhow, all that said, I am going to attempt to remove this capacitor without a hot air station and without lifting a pad. That is the challenge. 
So I've got my flux, very important part. Don't attempt to do this without a decent flux. I'm using Amtech, links in the description. Um, okay, so get a little bit of solder here and the soldering iron nice and hot. I have mine running quite hot, probably hotter than a lot of, a lot of people should maybe do at the beginning. And what I'm gonna try and do is just apply heat here and I'm trying to get new solder in there and push old solder out. And what we will hopefully find, as I'm just nudging here, I'm just gonna grab my tweezers, is that I can actually lift this a bit now, you see, as that one side is actually loose. Now, obviously I'm not gonna try and get it all the way off because that's just, if I tried to lift it from one side alone, it would be bad. So now I'm going to get it some um, solder wick which um, is braided copper that has got flux in it and it helps draw in solder now when you are using this you'll see see how shiny it gets as it sucks all that solder in um, and that's how you know when you've got enough heat and it's it's working well because you you apply heat to it and it just draws that solder in and it gets all glistening like that uh, and then obviously the other thing is make sure that you remove the soldering iron and the wick at the same time so that you don't leave the wick soldered to the pad and then you, um, uh, you can then yank the pad off by accident. So same process on the other side. Slow and steady wins the race when you do it this way. You rush it, um, you'll lift the pad. Um, so again, introducing new solder to the old stuff just doing that now I'm just gonna I'm just loading it up with solder I don't I don't mind how much I put in there okay it doesn't matter if I melt this plastic on the bottom of the capacitor it is going to get thrown in the bin okay so I've got a nice big glob of solder there grab our solder wick once again and Just again, suckle that solder up. See how shiny it gets? We can see it drawing all that solder in. Now, we get to a point where we're not going to get any more solder. That's just that's just how it is. You're not going to get all of it. But nice and gentle. And then what I'm going to do is apply some heat to this side. And I'm going to just gently lift it. And I'm going to take the soldering iron away and keep it lifted. And the idea being that that solder that is molten underneath it, um, it's... You know sort of as i lifted it apart when it dries it goes solid it's dried with that gap there so it sort of gives us the ability to kind of work this apart you know a little bit at a time so now we're coming at it from the other side apply the heat to there as you can see the pad's already clean the pad's clean because of all that new solder that i added and the flux so i'm going to put that there i'm going to gently lift super gentle i mean it's got to be really gentle i think i need a bit more wick there i think i just trans transferred some solder to it so and there you go and then I would think that with a little bit of luck I might even be able to get it off with this next go there we go off she comes so I just worked it off from one side to the other now of course it makes it look so easy when I'm doing it under the microscope you're doing it without a microscope you're doing it some magnifiers or something like that it, it can it can you know be be quite tricky so i'm not i'm not trying to make out like that hey as a walk in the park it does take practice you've got to you know do that on on sort of boards you don't care about and get that uh, get it all sorted first so um and um but uh once again if you have one with really really scungy looking capacitors um, and you know you've got concerns about using it. Just, you know, get um, get someone else to do it. You know, uh, get, or get get your hot air station. Hot air stations really help with the really cruddy, cr cruddy caps. Right. So for the others, I'm going to be using the hot air station as I normally do. And as I move around, I see more and more of these kind of black, scungy bits here. I I think, um, I think it's probably. I think I don't think there's any that will actually have broken. Um, I think they will be fine, but they will need to be cleaned up. All right, so let's start uh, removing some. So even though this is the wrong color, it's brown, and you would normally expect this to be shiny, this is the blade from like a box cutter with those blades that you can just sort of snap to size. You just basically snap a little bit like that, and you 
get those little little pieces like that coming off. Um, and so I use these as heat shields. Um, and I'm going to do that here. I'm going to put a few of these down to arrange a little shape around the other chips so that I don't burn them. And I also have these springs that I use to hook over the metal so that I can then stand them up and hold them in place. Um, so I'm going to just put a heat shield here and a heat shield there. I don't need to do too many because in the, in the proximity of this here, there's a, a great big electrolytic capacitor, which I'm going to remove. So I don't care how hot that gets. Uh, sorry, I know they're all like electrolytic capacitors. A great big axial electrolytic capacitor. Axial being that it's got pins coming out the side like that, um, as opposed to like a through hole, which uh, has two pins coming out one side. And they're radial, and then the axial has the two pins coming out either side. Um, and here, which is been, okay. Thank you, Jay. Yes, I know that uh, Jay has been using my little heat shield uh, trick for a little while now. Um, it's just very handy. I mean, it basically just comes down to trying to find, you know, something metal that you can just sort of plonk where you want. So, all right. So I'm going to start taking some of these off. This is a little group of three, which means I'll take them off all in one go. Um, because once you apply the heat, the board gets warm, it makes the next one and the next one easier to come off. So when they're in close proximity, that is. So applying some heat, trying to apply it as much as possible to the pins themselves, but sometimes the angle that you're coming in at, in, in at can make it hard to do. So I, with this one, I'm kind of just coming at it from the top and it will get hot eventually. And so will my fingers. Uh, and this is another thing, these stupid caps um, they have a yellow sticker on the outside, which describes what cap they are, and it that melts and then they stick to your tweezers. There we go. Okay, clean them up a bit. Uh, okay, then we move on to the next one. I have a sneaking suspicion some of these are going to pop. And, well, see, it's, it's hard to not react when they start making crackling noises. Yeah, so I mean, this one is like really bent and bulging. And I do smell the fishy smell, the fishy smell of the leaked electro electrolyte. Eh. Um, okay, I think you mentioned Putting flux on the ones you remove doesn't hurt either, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the yeah, you know, once again, flux does help them flows, so help solder flow. So if you put a little bit of flux onto the solder before you apply the heat, there's absolutely no harm in doing that whatsoever, which I am going to do here. Now I made mention before of this capacitor and the fact that it hovers right above. It's upside down there, but it says UE8, um, and. Uh, or it could be B3N, but it's UE8. And so that's the chip that often ends up having trouble um, because it gets um, leakage from this capacitor directly above it. So, all right, let's uh, get this one off. I'm going to protect my little UE8 as much as I can. All these are really old components, so we're wanting to try and shield them from the heat as much as possible. Um, they do form a bit of a a crust on the top of the solder and you when you apply heat that crust stays solid but the solder underneath gets molten and it pushes little solder beads out and then the next thing you know your board's covered in little tiny balls of conductive metal um, and that's not good coming off there we go okay there's another one that one wasn't as sticky that was good um okay what have we got here it's going to go Absolutely. Balls up my Mac Classic board recap. Uh, put in new tantalum caps and still got the pattern of death. Did you wash the board? Uh, take some photos. Yeah. So, yeah. This this is that's actually another really important thing. I mean, recapping is is uh, the cause, but not the symptom. A lot of the time, the symptom is all of the electrolyte all over the board, um, and the cause is the uh, the uh, the capacitors. So you can't do just one. Uh, if you clean the board and don't change the caps, you haven't really fixed the problem. You know, it's going to come back. And if you replace the caps and don't clean the board, uh, all of that residual gunk is still there. So uh, very important to clean it. I see um, uh, we've got a suggestion in here 
uh, of trying the dishwasher. And that is one where you will get uh, uh, supporters and uh, objectors to that particular process. And I am someone who is kind of on the fence with that one. I, if you are using a dishwasher and you're not using the dishwashing detergent and you're not putting other stuff in there with it, uh, I can't really see any reason why it would be a problem. Um, I think it would probably get it quite clean. You need to, of course, make sure that you get the board bone dry before you try to uh, apply any, um, any power to it. But uh, I, I can't really see any reason why that would be a very bad thing to do. I, I mean, I wash the boards in an ultrasonic cleaner, which of course is submerging it in liquid. So, um, you know, uh, but you, of course you just have to make sure it gets completely and totally bone dry afterwards. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure we've got, uh, you know, sort of supporters and objectors, uh, you know, sort of uh, say what you uh, think in the, uh, in the chat about whether you think putting it in the dishwasher is a good idea. But um, uh, some say yes, some say no. Um, okay, we've got the problem is the water, not the dishwasher itself. Yes, well, that, that you know, it could uh, well be the case. I mean, I think that, yeah, I see someone's mentioned the, uh, the hard water situation. Um, but uh, look, I mean... I don't know, I know a lot of people put them in the dishwasher and they haven't had any problems, but who knows? I mean, maybe in the future those boards will all die. So, anyhow. So, uh, next thing we've got just very quickly uh, is on this board, we have the power connector here and three caps above it. So, this is where a heat shield is very important. And in actual fact, I grab a little bit of this captain tape, captain, 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 whatever, tape, it's this yellow heat resistant tape. And I usually wrap a little bit of that around the, um, around the, the sort of power connector first, just to give it that extra little bit, bit of protection. Um, so in goes the tape. There we go. And then I drop my heat shield in. And I just don't want that plastic to melt. I mean, these caps are just so close to that plastic. Uh, okay, so, um, all right, so it looks like we've got the general vote against the dishwasher in the chat. So, um, I am uh, I am happy for uh, for that to be uh, the general consensus. Here comes another cap. It sounds like it's going to pop. There's one. There's two. And there's three. And wow, look at that one. Far out. It's so scunchy. Um, yeah, that's going to take some cleaning, that one. I mean, it, it, I'm not even sure whether there might have been some burning on that there. There's kind of a blackening going on around that. Look at my tweezers, for goodness sake. Um, yeah, that sort of looks really bad. Um, yeah, because, it, look, it is worth pointing out that in my ultrasonic cleaner, I use distilled water. Um, I buy this distilled water, I fill it up with that, and then with the detergent that I use, so... And then, of course, once it's clean, I then rinse it in isopropyl alcohol. Um, it helps sort of rinse the stuff off, and it also uh, helps to um, push the water out. It dis displaces the water, so it um, makes it a lot quicker to dry. So, um, Right, so um, back to this absolute revolting scungy board, which I just cannot believe I said this board looked good, because it doesn't at all. It looks really bad. Now we've got one here up against the, the, what do you call it, the uh, um, PDS slot. I just want to, I'm just over here grabbing an SE board. I've got a busted SE board here because I just wanted to show something here very quickly. I'm just going to jump over to here and just show, this is a Mac SE. This is an SE30. And I had this discussion with Steve the other day about the uh, ports. And as you can see, they are actually different between the SE and the SE30. The SE30 is significantly longer. 
So uh, even though they are both PDS slots, they are not the same. So you can't put, um, um, you know, what it, uh, you can't put, what, oh, is there a dead bug on here? There probably is. Um, yeah, so you can't put um, uh, the same cards on there. So anyhow, just, just pointing that out, that the SE and the SE30 do have different size PDS slots. And finding cards for the SE is really hard. They're, they're out there, but they're pretty rare uh, and they're expensive. So, But anyhow, uh, the reason why I mentioned that is because I have to now remove um, a, a capacitor right from next to the PDS slot. PDS slot, capacitor. Okay, so I'm coming up for an hour. Sorry, people. I need to get better at getting faster these, don't I? Oh, that's the wrong thing for me. Tweezers not soldering on. There's some heat. Come on. You know you want to come off. Wow, this... Uh, there we go. That cap really started bulging up. I do feel that we might get an explosion at some stage during this, and then you'll get to hear me squeal. Um, all right, got one here right next to the um, ROM slot. Yeah, so again, need our little shield. Uh, we're nearly done getting these caps off, by the way. Um, and I, after this one I'll go and have a look at the chat again because I haven't looked in a little while so there could be all these questions or maybe people are still talking about the dishwasher it's off um that plastic looks like a lovely black marshmallow. Yeah, oh yeah, it is. Yeah, it does. The, it, it, when it gets all squishy down there, it sort of, it, yeah, it does look kind of marshmallow-ish. Um, these different slots. Flux. I'm being asked to put flux on. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll put this flux on. This is the stuff I don't like. This is the stuff I got given for free. And I'll show you why I don't like it. You watch when I put it on. Ready? Ugh. Ugh. What does that bloody look like? It's opaque. It's I can't see through it. I don't like it. I'm not going to buy that one. No matter what they say. Oh, hang on. Guess what I didn't put on? Heat shield, RAM slots. Look out. We're going to get a marshmallow out of this one as well. Oh, got it. I'll tell you what, this other flux, I don't know what it is about the smell. It smells like, it smells like a dessert. It smells like sugar. It's really weird. It's just such a strange smell. There you go. Off she comes. You can actually see the difference with using the flux there, the way this goes all smooth and shiny. It's quite extraordinary. Um... All right, so uh, I'm pretty sure that's all the caps, or certainly all of the surface mount electrolytic caps. Um, so let's go back to here. So they're all be, they've all been taken off. What we do have are these two axial caps. Now, if you're not sure about replacing these, generally you can keep them on. I mean, they're capacitors, which means electrolytic capacitors, which, which means they will fail eventually. But I've never known for these ones to actually be a problem. But when people pay me to recap, a recap so I will be replacing these as well now the way I remove these is I cut them off and then I remove the pins um, and um, I am going to demonstrate this process uh, and I'm going to be doing this specifically for Charlie so that uh, we can uh, try and get these little pins out as quickly and easily as possible <coughs> um, so let's jump across here 
Ultrasonic cleaners can be expensive, great if you plan to do a lot of work, but you can get away with using isopropyl alcohol and then using a can of air to blow under components. Yep, but I, I would agree with that. You know, maybe a bit of a toothbrush in the hard areas. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's, you know, you definitely can uh, get away with iso alcohol. I would agree with that. Um, do keep in mind that ultrasonic cleaners, they come in a variety of prices. You can buy one for buying jewelry, for cleaning jewelry for less than $100. You can buy uh, ones the size of a room for cleaning huge car parts and stuff like that um, for, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Now, I have a $200 ultrasonic cleaner that holds 10 litres of liquid. Um, and it works really well for the size boards that I use. These boards fit in it entirely. Um, and it does an amazing job. Um, I mean, to give you an idea, ultrasonic cleaners don't use agitation. They use, um, uh, what's it called, um, cavitation. So obviously a washing machine uses agitation. You put the detergent in, it moves around and stuff wiggles around and it gets clean that way. Uh, an ultrasonic cleaner uses cavitation. It uses uh, high frequency sound and creates these little tiny little air bubbles that bombard dirt and knock it off. Now, you can tell how good a job they're doing because you start off with this crystal clear liquid and then after a while, it looks like this. That is some liquid saved from my ultrasonic cleaner after my last uh, sort of water change. Um, and you know, keeping in mind that, the, you know, the, as I say, it, it does, it, the, nothing moves inside it. I mean, everything stays in there still and it, uh, and it just cleans, um, you know, stuff out uh, beautifully. It does an amazing job. And that, and that is a, an indication that even a cheap $200 one can clean very well. So, okay. So, let's get back to it, shall we? Um, changing back to microscope big. All right, so, actual cap, snippers, snip, another one here, snip, snip, and uh, one more, one more, snip. So what we have now, we have two, caps with little pins sticking out of them and we have little pins sticking up out of the board and then we just need to remove those pins now I'm going through this process uh, just to demonstrate the easiest way to get these out quickly and easily now we start with a nice hot soldering iron that's a very important thing the next thing I do is I put some flux onto the end of the pin there now, it's a lot, usually, a lot easier to come at it from the pin side because you can get more heat onto the pin than on the other side where the pin isn't sticking out. Then I get new solder. And it always seems really counterintuitive to put more solder on something that you're wanting to remove. But what it does is it, it, that solder wraps around that pin and it allows you to more effectively transmit heat to it and then it'll come loose a lot easier. So, um, it puts the ultrasonic lotion on its skin, or, or else it gets the hose again. Okay. Um, geez, if someone wasn't reading the comments, they would think I'd just gone very peculiar then, wouldn't they? Um, okay, so we've got our soldering iron here. I've got my beveled ledge. I'm applying that flat bevel to the pin. Geez, I don't even need to add new solder, but I'm doing it anyway. And then you can see that pin wiggling around. I will then grab my pair of tweezers, and I will lift it up. Nice and easy. Let's go on to the next one. Flux. Sutter. Applying heat. You see the way that solder wraps around the pin? And that's just helping me to get heat. Well, you know, get that whole pin nice and hot. Just give it a little bit of time getting hot. Now, this one's being a little bit stubborn, and this is something I've mentioned before, and that is that when you have a pin that's attached to the ground plane, it's often a lot harder to get heat to it because that heat's being dissipated by that large plane of copper on the board. And of course, this one could well be bent on the other side too. It's coming out there. Here she goes. There it is, not bent, just hard to get out. So that's one out. Yes, we know it took you 20 minutes. 
sorry, I'm just I'm just being fun. Um, okay, so next to this one. And, and of course, the hardest part with this is getting the solder out from the hole, because obviously we're going to have to stick a, a new component in there. That hole needs to be empty, and that's the next process. And that can sometimes be a bloody nightmare. Um, so, solder, there we go. Get my uh, tracerus. He's going down. There we go, got him. There's that. And then, last one. And I probably don't even need to add solder. I've got so much on the end of my iron here. Apply that there. And there we go. Out she comes. All right. So there's our four pins removed. Uh, and then... Um, and then I will grab my solder wick once again. Uh, and I have mentioned before, I use good wick. Uh, I don't know how good it is, but uh, I find it always does what I want. So that's the brand I buy. Um, I buy it in two millimeter width. It comes in thicker widths. I've got a three millimeter as well that I use when I'm doing hardcore wicking. But most of the time I use two. They actually have a one, I think a one and a half mil or even a one mil one. But I've just found the two works better. So there you go. All right, so got solder in there. We've got a little bit of flux. We've got wick and we're gonna just put this flat on top. And what we're wanting to see, uh, see how it gets shiny? When it gets shiny, we know it's pulled that solder in. So that one worked well. That's a nice empty hole now. And move on. Let's try this one. And let's just put that on there. Shiny. Look at that sucking all that solder up. Still going. Still more solder. There we go. We've got an empty hole there too. I'm telling you, it's not always that easy. Um, there's that one going to trim this down it is one of the downsides to using wick um no go faster juice no i i it, it's it's two o'clock it's lunchtime it's lunchtime i mean geez i'd love a drink now i couldn't even begin to tell you i'm always getting peer pressure peer pressure from the mac yakas they're always trying to get me to drink when i do these streams i will do one one day i promise i'll do a, a drunk recapping on my own board not a client's board now you may notice that I just I walked away from this one. See me walk away from that one? I just didn't I didn't finish it. That's the one that I had a lot of trouble getting the um, uh, the pin out of because it's on the ground plane. Um, and hardcore wicking, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so all right. I'm going to flip this over onto the other side to try and get this uh, this last little bit of solder out of this hole. So um, let me just find where it is. It is where is is it there? I think. Is that it? Yep, that's it there. Uh, there. So focus, focus, focus. There we go. That's it there. And as you can see, there is the reason why it's so bloody hard to get that thing hot. See all these green crisscrossies? That's all that copper that's sucking all that heat away. So I'm going to put a little bit of flux. I'll put the yucky stuff that I don't like under there. And I'll just go. Now see how it's not getting really shiny, which means it hasn't really pulled that solder out. Now you can just sort of tell when it's working and when it's not. So then I'm going to add a bit more solder. If I get really stuck with this, what I then do is I grab a much bigger tip that generates, that has a lot more heat. Um, and, uh, ah, hey Greedy. Okay, so let's just put this on here. I mean, I've got to get this sorted out soon, otherwise it is just going to be so boring. Far out. Okay, so last resort. If I don't get this off, off, I might just sort of leave that for another time. I have a great big, oopsie. Ah, I'm gonna save, I'm not gonna say what I was gonna say, because that would just be way too much double entendre. I have this um, soldering iron tip, and it has a very large beveled e edge, and uh, I'm going to try getting that up there with a little bit more heat. 
So the larger the surface area, the more heat you're going to get onto what you want. So as you can see, this one is quite large. Let's clean it up a bit. Why not use a solder sucker? That's a very good question. I do have one here. I find they're really hard to get solder out of these holes. If you could put heat on one side and the solder sucker on the other, that would be good, but you need kind of three hands to do that. Um, when you're actually just trying to heat this up and you put the solder sucker next to it, it just doesn't seem to work. But as it has been suggested, I am going to try it and I may end up eating my words. So just putting some more solder on there. Getting new solder out is usually easier than old solder. Often what happens is that when you're trying to get the hole hot, it's hard to get it really hot and still leave enough of it exposed to get the solder sucker there. See, I've got to try and get that all hot. And then let's try it. No, still didn't do it. So I'm going to try again for the wick and just hope for the best. Okay, now, let's try it with this grey big one. You get a lot of heat flat onto the surface. And of course, not wanting to wreck this board either. Yes, consign it. Dagnab it. Um, another Yosemite Sam excre expletives. Excretives. Okay. There we go. Solder loves company. Come on. Come on. Oh man, this is just driving me absolutely bonkers. Coming at it from the other side again. I do things like this very slowly sometimes just to make people feel good that, you know, if they're having trouble, that's all fine. Hey, look at that. There's a hole. Hooray. Someone buy some champagne. Okay. Uh, grabbing my soldering iron tip. I've mentioned this before, but um, the... Um, I've forgotten. Uh, oh yes, the uh, Hacko soldering iron allows you to change the tips without burning yourself while it's still hot. So that's one of the things I really like about this soldering iron station. Um, right, so uh, just gonna quickly check here. The sucker needs a more precise nozzle, I assume. Well, I've never known them to have really, really fine nozzles. I mean, they have a, you know, Generally, so this has a particularly big nozzle, but as I say, I've never had any success with the sucker on uh, on getting the solder out of holes like that. Um, they're uh, they're fine for solder. They're fine if the pin's still in there, um, but of course I didn't do it that way. So maybe I should have done that way. But anyhow, it's not normally as hard as it was today. So they're all out. Now we have to go in and clean these pads, which is the boring job and it's very tedious and I'm sorry, but the one advantage we have is these ones are so spongy that it could be fun. I mean, see this, see this crust that this gets. I mean, this crusty stuff on the outside, the, the way that solder has oxidized, I mean, it, it is just really, really nasty. And we've got to get rid of all of that. And when I start applying heat to this, you'll see that all start to flake away as I push new solder on and pushes that old crusty solder away. So I'll grab my cheap solder because this is just going to get wicked away. There's no point in putting expensive solder on there. So this is a 60% uh, tin, 40% lead, so a 60-40 leaded solder. Uh, the fancy expensive ones are with 63-47, I think is the ratio, something like that. Um, so my fancy one here I use when I'm actually putting the components on, but when I'm just cleaning pads off, I use the cheap stuff. Um, an iron with a vacuum built in. Yes. 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 I would like one of those. I don't have one. Um, they're not particularly cheap, in particular here in Australia. Um, the cheap ones aren't that good because the cheap ones tend to just clog up all the time. Um, but yeah, I really do want to get um, a, um, you know, sort of a mechanical solder sucker, soldering iron thing. I'd really like one of them. So, okay, 
uh, adding some solder uh, is one of the things I've said on this before. I, it might look like I am rubbing that pad, but I'm actually just hovering like a you know, hair above it. Because if I were to actually be pushing down on it, uh, I'm likely to lift it off. So applying heat, putting new solder on, you can see, and you can actually see it all here. This is all that crusty stuff that's been displaced by the new solder. All these crunchy bits. So they're what we're trying to get rid of. And then we put that on there to the next one. I sort of want to just keep moving this around until as much of this pad has new solder on it as possible. And there's no none of that kind of black scunge. Uh, these ones weren't too bad because of the way I took them off. They don't need much at all. By the way, anyone out there from not Australia who has been following the news about all of the horrendous bushfires here in Australia, just letting you know that although some of them are still burning, particularly in Victoria, the state below me, um, or south of me, uh, uh, most of, or a lot of those fires are either well and truly under control or out now because we have had rain. Uh, it's not enough rain to break the drought, but it's enough to stop a lot of those bushfires. So there's just a little bit of a topical update there. Okay, so um, the flux protects the, the non-pad area then. Well, the, the flux is, the main thing that flux is doing is Making, helping the solder do its job. Um, so the flux is all gonna get cleaned off after I do this, but the main thing I wanna do with this is I wanna get the gunk off the pads. And I'm getting the gunk off the pads ultimately using new solder. And the flux is helping the new solder do its job. So, um, so um, Yes, I mean, uh, I should mention, of course, that although that the fire, a lot of the fire situation is well under control, um, the number of little animals that no longer have homes is kind of devastating. Um, and, oh, and of course, the number of people that no longer have homes, I probably should have mentioned them first, my apologies for those people, please do not take offence. Um, but yeah, we're talking about, you know, sort of thousands of people ha that don't have homes, and we're talking about um, probably somewhere in the vicinity they're estimating around about a billion animals have lost their lives in these fires. So, um, yeah, not, not ideal. That billion with a B. Okay, so, coming back to these pads, changing to uh, more current topics, they are coming up really, really clean. And thank you to everyone who's been saying nice words in the chat about the bushfires. I do appreciate it. Um, it's not something that affects us greatly in terms of our day-to-day -day life here because I'm in Sydney, which is the main sort of Sydney basin, which is not really at risk of bushfire, apart from some places close to national parks and that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it has been a, uh, a pretty unbelievable time. Uh, the, this is, would have to easily be one of the hottest summers that we've ever had. Um, the hottest day I think we've had so far this summer would be uh, 48 degrees Celsius, which is, I think it's about 115 Fahrenheit, something like that. So, and uh, days like that are just getting way more common. Um, so. You know, it's just not ideal when it comes to bushfires starting. Um, this one looks a little bit ugly. I'm just going to give that a little bit of a scrape. Um, those who have seen my videos before will know that I, I like to get out and give these things a bit of a scrape sometimes. Uh, very, very, very gently. And most of the time when you see these black ones, most of the time when you see these black areas, you scrape them off and you do find good copper underneath it. Um, so 118.4 Fahrenheit. Okay, thank you for that, Jake. The uh, little change. So yeah, that's um that's that's the sort of temperature that when you sort of step outside, it kind of hurts your throat because it's so hot. Um, I imagine it's like what it's like for people who live in very very cold areas as well. That sort of feeling of it being a bit hard to breathe because of the uh, cold. 
Um, okay, now I've cleaned those four pads. Uh, that was all nice. This is, if anyone has any questions about that cleaning process, I've covered it in my, uh, my other videos, a lot of my other videos, where I just basically put on flux, new solder, and then I wick it away. And I use the wick very, very gently to um, uh, just uh, uh, get that old solder off and any black gunk. And then what I want to see at the end is I want to see a perfectly clean, square, shiny pad. And it will just make new solder going onto it way, way easier. Okay, so... Uh, as bad as these pads are, I mean, you will notice they are cleaning up really well. Uh, that gunky stuff, that crusty stuff, is actually coming off quite easily. Um, you just see it all breaking away as I run the soldering iron over. There's some just there that I'm pointing to with my my solder. Oh, just coming away. It's, it's really nice, actually. Um, we've often talked about how um, I would never, ever recommend twisting and pulling a capacitor off, which is sometimes suggested by people as a way of removing them. Uh, do we get the ultrasonic experience? I can certainly put it in there and switch it on. I will definitely do that. The downside is, of course, it's a horrible noise. So the moment I switch it on, I have to sort of stop the stream very soon after that because it's just intolerable, the noise. So, uh, okay, cleaning off the new solder and giving it a gentle wipe. You must caress it very gently. Okay. All right. But an interesting thing about the SE30 is that it is probably the most commonly recapped Mac I get. Rarely do I uh, not have an SE30 here for recapping. I mean, they're. Um, I mean, that's largely because they all need recapping, of course, but um, they, um, uh, they're just so popular. Um, everyone loves them. And uh, I'm, I'm one of them. I, I really enjoy... Uh, I've got one. I'm very happy to have one. Um, this one here is, is black, as you can see, so I'm just going to scrape away the copper on this one. Make sure that it goes all the way through to this via. Those who are not familiar with the term via, a via is one of these. I think it's Latin for way, via. Um, and it is uh, basically um, a little copper tube that goes through the board. There's a little hole and there's a little copper tube there and then the, uh, the trace attaches to the via, and then the via sends that to somewhere else on the board. Now, often, those vias just go from the top of the board to the bottom of the board, and so that's all fine. That's all nice and easy. It's just, you know, that's all it does. But sometimes vias actually distribute power to um, other layers within the board. I think this board has at least four layers, possibly more. Uh, so they have little sandwich layers of copper in between. And so those vias sometimes, you know, you'll have a look and you'll, you'll, you'll see the via on the top of the board. And then when you look through to the bottom, you find that there are no traces on the other side. And that's because it's attaching to a trace of one of the layers sandwiched in the middle. So um, that's uh, just explaining that very quickly. Um, if this is Bruce without Go Quick Juice. <laughs> Uh, not subscribe to Bruce's channel. Sure, is it? Thank you. Yes, yes. Please do subscribe and like. I really appreciate it. Um, I have been going now for an hour and 20 minutes, and I'm sorry this is slow. I have uh, 14 viewers at the moment. Thank you to all 14 of you for staying on and watching. Um, and you will also find a link in the description here if you are wanting to do an SE30 yourself. You find a link to my little cheat sheet, which is uh, a little guide with a picture of the board and the different measurements uh, and polarities, you know, the uh, sizes, the capacitance and voltage and the uh, polarity of each of the capacitors there. You can, there's a link in the description. You can download that as a PDF or there's a JPEG of it there as well. So there you go. Uh, Bruce, you need a Twitter. Yes, I do. Uh, and I also need someone to teach me how to use it. Um, I think I do actually have a Twitter account. Um, so, uh, all right, so, um, 
th thank you. Uh, uh, Alex has just thanked me. Alex is, uh, 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 regularly puts uh, little uh, thanking comments into my videos, and I do appreciate that, Alex. Um, Bruce needs a Patreon. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm getting there. Um, all right, so I'm back here uh, cleaning up these pads. And after I've finished cleaning up these pads, I'm going to do something exciting. <gasps> um, I mean, not really, but I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, just to keep just to keep the excitement, you know, just so that everyone's sort of like, oh, wow, what's going to happen next? Um, one of the good things about the SE30, I guess, is it's, it doesn't have that many caps. What is it? Ten, it's got two of the axials and 11, 11? Yeah, 11 surface mount electrolytics. That's not too bad. Um, you know, it's the worst ones, those bloody, what is it, LC something or others, LC2 or LC1 or something. They got like 15 or 16 or something. What a pain. Um, I don't charge any more for them though. Okay. So here's the question. With the benefit of hindsight, do you reckon Apple would have not put electrolytics on these? Right. Okay, so that's da 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 oh, I forgot about this one. This is our little friend that wrecks UE8. So I'm going to try and speed this up. This is just going to get so boring. Uh, whereabouts in Sydney are you based, Bruce? I am based in Western Sydney, um, in uh, very near to a suburb called Blacktown. Um, and just for people out there who might be thinking, hmm, Blacktown, that's an interesting name for a town. It was actually called that because very early on when they started, I think, uh, populating this area, there were quite a lot of indigenous folks out there, people with black skin. And for some reason, that rather horrendous name for this place is still around. I think it's probably time it got a name change because to name a town Blacktown because it had black people is kind of really offensive. Um, but... Well, maybe that's just me, but anyhow, I didn't name it. Um, and uh, it's about probably, I don't know, it was 25 miles, I suppose, from the coast. Sydney, of course, you know, the actual main CBD of Sydney is very close to the water. Um, and I'm about, you know, probably 25 miles inland from that. I notice I'm using miles for my US friends. Um, but uh, uh, you consider those two should deserve recapping. Yes, now I am actually going to. Do, I don't know if I'll do it as a live stream, but I am going to do a video of recapping the SE30 power supply. And the reason being that they do have a tendency to fail, um, and it's not a particularly difficult job to recap them. There's only a handful of caps you need to do. So. Um, Flux, flux, I flux, flux. Oh, I'm going to use my stinky flux. I've got to get rid of this one. Um, so, uh, getting that all looking good, and then getting some of my wick and getting that clean. Uh, how's everyone going there? I think people are all still reeling at the fact that I live in a place called Blacktown. Um, no, I think I think no, I think truth is they would have gone the same route. Yes, I agree, Jay. I don't think I don't think they would have thought if they had the benefit of hindsight about these caps and what they did. I don't think they would turn around and go, you know what, we should do this differently so they last longer. Nah. Um, okay. Better than poop my pants, Bill. Yeah, probably. Um, yes, I mean, it is a... This country does have an interesting history, but not all of it's pretty. Okay. 
Right, and I think this is the last one. Won't that be good? I, I, I really appreciate the patience of everyone here sitting here watching me clean these things. I mean, far out, how dull. I'm using more of this white stinky stuff just because I need to get rid of it. I don't use it when I'm actually placing the caps because because it's opaque, I can't see properly. Um, I like to be able to see, you know, when I'm positioning the cap, the, uh, the sort of clearer stuff is a lot easier to work with. I mean, I can't really complain. They gave it to me for nothing, but pff, it's crap. Oops. Jeez. I don't know if anyone saw that, but I just soldered the wick onto the pad and then gave it a yank. I'm glad that pad decided that it wanted to stay on the board. Right. Out of camera. Sorry. Just going to clean these up. Okay. Right. Now, I promised something exciting. So, I'm going to do it. Uh, early on in the stream, we spotted this real ugliness on this little cereal port chip um when you wipe off the pads at the end is that just a rag or uh, yeah it's, it's isopropyl alcohol so uh just using a um a uh, q-tip or cotton bud or cotton swab depending on what you want to call it here in australia we call them cotton buds um and uh yes yeah, so i just dip it into i've got one of these little makeup dispenser thingies that you get you sort of push down on them and it makes a little bit of alcohol come up to the top and i just dip them into those and uh, and just clean all that um that excess flux off i don't need to clean it off from you know from the purpose of genuine cleaning because i'm going to stick it in the ultrasonic i just do it to clean it off for when i put the uh the new component on uh my error was off camera phew okay right um so here we have our really crusty looking rs 232 four, two, four, uh, yeah, 242 I don't know the um the um and this it's in a what are uh, what do they call this package q uh, quad uh, q f f n or something I can't remember I'm terrible at remembering the names of IC packages someone will probably be able to get it up onto the uh, onto the chat there what sort of this is the ones with the the pins curl around underneath these uh, can be put into a little socket like you would with the um, 68882 FPUs on some of the old Macs, uh, or they can also be soldered directly onto the board. Uh, wouldn't it be prudent to do an ultrasonic clean first and then deal with what might remain? Just wondering on strategy. There, this is something that we mentioned in, uh, in my last stream, and that is that when you ultrasonic clean, you often end up taking away some of the evidence. You some, end up sometimes hiding some of the stuff that might show you other problems that exist on the board so i kind of want to retain all of that black stuff because it might actually lead me to find uh, a potentially another broken component or something like that he's gonna do it he's gonna do it so applying to meet i need my big tweezers for this um i have big tweezers here we are these are my big tweezers and they open up a little bit more so that i can put them around a component like this. Now I can't quite get this whole component in, but anyhow, just going to apply some heat to this. Oh, by the way, this is the exciting bit I was talking about. So if you don't find this exciting, sorry. But this has got to go. It's got to come off. Just heating all around. There we go. Off she comes. Now. That does reveal something quite good. Um, I really thought that this was like burned through, but it doesn't appear to be the case. So I am now going to douse it liberally in flux and do exactly as I do. You know, I made that mistake. Uh, where did I put the, the component? I do this all the time. I take things off. Oh, here we are. I've got to put it here. There is a spot. That's where the components I want to keep. Um, I'll have a close look at that component in a moment to see if it looks like it's dead. Um, so, um, okay, then we'll just do what we do with the, um, the other pads. Just again, gently rubbing around, trying to push all that old crusty stuff away. 
as you can see this one here uh, is, is is looking pretty bad that's going to need some scraping and it may reveal further problems but I'm just going to keep going I just want these um, I want these little blobs of solder as much as possible to look like little lozenges uh, like a little sort of capsule um, or half of one anyway as you can see I've got quite a large glob of solder here on the on the end of the uh, soldering iron that I'm just sort of rolling around as much as possible to just clean up so that's that then we will get our wick and we will do again we're just doing the same process that we do with the capacitor removal we just take away the solder we do some gentle rubbing caressing the pads now this one here has got a little black blob on it but in actual fact I don't really need to pay too much attention to that one because you might notice there's no trace coming off it which means it don't go nowhere um, but I'm still going to clean it up because I'm a pro there we go So, going to move my way up. Let's get that into camera. Um, see, one of the things that often happens when I'm filming these is I end up doing stuff out off camera. And the reason for that is that what I look through here is a big circle. Uh, but what gets captured by the camera is a rectangle from inside that circle. So a lot of stuff that I see isn't seen by the camera. Now, I am really worried about losing a pad here. I may not uh, look like I am, but I am. So I am just being really, really gentle. Um, these pads really just look like they want to they wanna get off the board. It's like they're saying, let me off. And I don't want that to happen. So I'm now going to get some isopropyl alcohol. I'm going to give that a good old wipe and then I'm going to use my trusty scalpel to try and clean up these really crusty pads. Now I don't think I am going to be able to completely restore this one here uh, because I think a lot of that pad is actually gone but there's still enough there in order for us to uh, uh, attach the component so that's fine. And this does look like it has some blackening so it looks like there has been some sort of short there. That I mean, look at this. See that? Let's zoom in. We're zooming in. Uh, you know, this stuff is really very ugly. Um, look at the rust there. I mean, that is that's rusted right through there. I, I would be very surprised if that serial port still worked in its current state. But once I've finished with this, I'll be able to get a big enough blob of solder on that to, to work. Um, so I think we'll be fine. I can zoom all the way to about there. Um, that's my full zoom, and that's you know, was that four and a half times something like that. No, it'd be yeah. This is what 0.7 times. I don't know. I don't know. It's what it says on the dial, but it's obviously more than 0.7 times. So who knows? Um, but I mean, look at this. Look at this scunge that is on that on the end of that cotton bud. I mean, that is real grubby. So, uh, look, I think we're probably okay, apart from the fact that I keep dropping everything. I think we're, yeah, I, these all look like they're still making contact. So I don't think we'll need to worry too much. I think that component will go back on and work. But I am going to have a quick close look at the component. So, right, now... Uh, RAP serial port. Yeah, no more serial. Um, mind you, do you really miss it? I don't know. Okay. This is the one that we discovered early on. And I'm just wanting to expose this trace. Get all the coating off the top, that black coating. And then what I'll usually do is just give it a final clean 
with some flux. And does that gunk cause corrosion? Uh, which gunk are you referring to? You're referring to the gunk that I was just cleaning off that trace, or you're referring to the gunk being the flux that I've been putting on. If you're asking about the flux, if you left enough of it on there, it could probably trap some moisture and eventually cause some corrosion. They call it no clean flux, which means it's not actually corrosive. But as I say, it can obviously, you know, you could probably trap a bit of moisture there. Uh, if you're talking about the actual, that gunk on the pad, if you leave, if you end up with a black trace and you just leave it and ignore it, it's likely to rot through eventually. So as much as possible, um, you, you're going to want to try and clean up that black stuff. Uh, and this is what how I do it here. I generally um, grab a little bit of um, uh, wick that still has some solder on it. And I just gently rub over that, that trace that I've exposed, tinning it. So by putting solder on it, I am protecting it. I'm coating it. I will then, of course, put UV solder mask on it as well. But I'm just that will help to stop it from any further corrosion. So that trace is now sort of tidied up and ready to go. Um, all right, so, um, right, well that component is off. Now let's see what that component looks like, shall we? Shall we? Right, I'll just put a little bit of um, solar onto this and a bit more wicking and a little bit more focus. And these ones will never be as good as new, that just can't be helped, but I can at least get them so that they will work. Time to cut the wick. Right, there we go. All right, so that's pretty much ready for a new component to go on. And let's have a look at the component. So this here is my chip. And you can see quite a bit of gunk here, but I don't really see anything that looks like nasty burning or anything like that. So I'm, I, look, I mean, maybe I should just put a new one on, but I think I'm all right. Um, okay. Now, I'm gonna put some flux on here and I'm going to try and clean this up a little bit if I can. Um, I need my tweezers because otherwise I'm gonna burn my fingers. <laughs> you know those big tweezers I was talking about? Ah, here they are. So, get some solar onto the end of my tip. And roll this down and just sort of do this. Uh, clean it up. Part of me sort of thinks, you know what, I should just get a new one of these that's clean, but I don't know. If, I, if it is going to work, I'd rather just keep the old one. Just getting that flux and that new solder on there. Just cleaning all the old gunk off. Need a little bit more flux here. Blech. Bubble, bubble, bubble. Now... If anyone's sort of noticing that I don't have a fume extractor here, I do use a fume extractor when I'm working here, uh, like not live streaming, but um, when uh, when I'm live streaming, it makes a lot of noise, so I just use this fan behind me to blow the fumes away. It's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. Um, okay, so... Yoing, yoing. Gets rid of all that sort of new solder that I've put on. I probably need to stand this up just to get all the solder off the side. And then I'm going to whip out the toothbrush. Look out, you know things are rough when your toothbrush comes out. So this is, yeah, this is really right now where I could use a third hand. I want this held up like that. And I want wick. And I want solder. It's just um, what I can do. What you can do is you can use, there are lots of little holders and stuff you can use, but I, even just one of these little guys, you know, just a little a little one of these, you just use that, hold it up, 
like that. It'll melt, but who cares? <coughs> All right. So the solder is going to stick largely to the outside of these pins and the bottom. So I just want them to be as clean as I can get. And that doesn't look clean, but that's because it's got burnt flux all over it. It is actually quite clean under that. Um, and something wrong. I am sorry, this is really dull. I didn't, you know, this is just something that has to be done, but it's a really, really boring bit. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll be finished this bit soon, trust me. Um, now that there looks like that's the one that I think had that extra corrosion on it because that one's kind of got a little dip, little bit missing there. Um, and we'll keep moving. Oops. I said this, um, live stream was going to be a quick one. <laughs> <sighs> I mean, I've done lots of SC30s before, um, so there's every reason why it should be a, a quick one, but, you know. I like to chat, and I like to answer questions. If I've missed any questions that anyone has asked, um, please don't take it personally. I'm still very new to this live streaming thing, and, you know, I just, I do miss some of the comments that come through. So if enough time goes by and your question doesn't get answered, please feel free to ask it again. That's clean, that's clean. I'm sure there's still one side I haven't done. That side. Right, and then we'll hit it with a toothbrush. Ah, pissing me off. That one, that one. Okay, and do this not in the microscope. There we go. Ah, uh, look, see, with a leg crippled like that, I'd opt for a new one. Where is the fun in that? I mean, he's right. I mean, like, I absolutely cannot deny that Jay is 100% right about his assessment. Um, but, okay, let's move down here and let's just douse this sucker in ISO alcohol. I better test this cereal port before I give it back to the customer, hadn't I? Yeah. Yeah. See, this is this is the this is the pin we're talking about. Oh, yes. Pin we're talking about down here, just on the corner, out of focus. Drop my tweezers. Okay. This one here, where it's sort of a little bit corroded there. And th there's a really good case being made for replacing this component. All right, okay, I'll take a vote. Um, put a new one in, or use the old one. Um, and uh, you vote for which one you want me to do, and I will, I will do it. I will go with the majority vote. Okay, Alex is saying keep it. Okay, Steve's saying keep it. It's looking, it's looking delicious. Paint customer, new chip. Your board, keep the old one. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, see, this is see, he does this for a living. So, you know, I mean, not with the old Max, but uh, as in repairing people's boards. So. Uh, if it doesn't work, that's another I'm all for keeping the original. Okay, so, I mean, I'm afraid the keep it's kind of have the majority at the moment, despite the fact that the replace it is probably the more sensible thing to do. Um, so, oh, uh, well, yep, I guess, uh, 
I guess what it really comes down to is if it doesn't work, I will replace it. All right. So now we're going to put it back. Um, and for anyone who has never done this before, uh, there are probably other ways of doing it, but this is the way that I do it. Uh, I'm just going to get those pads nice and clean. One way you can do it, and this is not the way I do it, one way you can do it is you can put a little gentle blob of solder onto each one of those uh, pads. Then you place the component uh, with a bit of flux and you use a hot air station until all of those pads melt at the one time and then uh, it just sort of solders into position. Now, that sounds super logical, but it is not um, the way I do it. We've just had another vote for replace it. But you know what? I'm going to put the old one back. And if it doesn't work, I will replace it. I will test this for the customer. If it doesn't work, I'll replace it. I'm not sure how I'm going to test it. I don't even know if I've got any serial devices. Um, right, okay. So what I do do, what I do is I get flux onto these cleaned pads like this. And I then get the component and I place it on and I know which way around it goes based on these little things here, which you can't see because they're off camera. There's a little square and then or a little sort of corner angle. There's a little corner angle. Um, there was a little corner angle there, it's gone. But up here, we've got this bent angle there. And then you'll see that when I put the chip in place, it actually has, so that way around, one bent bit here, and that that little sort of sort of flat edge goes matches up with this flat edge there. So that's the way I know which way around to go. On these chips, their pin one is always indicated by this little indentation. So that one in the middle there is pin one, and that's it. Also matches up with this dot, which is now out of focus here. That's pin one. And then they go around in anti-clockwise, I think. So it's pin one, two, three, four, five, around that way. I think that's all right. I'm pretty sure it's anti-clockwise. Um, do those old chips not have a dot to indicate pin one? See, there you go. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, so... Um, Right, now this is what I do. I line this up as best as I can. It's quite difficult to do with the microscope because it's very hard to get that straight top-down angle. And I'm trying to line this up as best as I possibly can. And then I pick one pin and I tack it down like you would with a weld. So I get my fancy schmancy solder and not my cheap stuff. And I get a little bit onto the tip of the iron here get my tweezers and I hold this in position and I tack down one pin. Now you can see that there's a little rise there where the solder is rising up to meet that pin. So if I now zoom back out again and get her in focus to about there, if I were to give this a gentle nudge, it's held on by that one pin, but I have to be very gentle because obviously otherwise I will tear the pin. Um, okay. <laughs> it's got here now. Yes, YouTube's notification system is hot garbage. We all know that. We'll get it, I'm sure they get around to sorting it out one day. Okay, so we've got our one tacked on there. Then we've got then I'm going to tack on one on the opposite end, and that will be here. And that will give me enough strength to then do some of the others. So there we go. That's now tacked on. So I've got a tack there on that side, a tack on that side. Then I will spin it around to do, to lose it, spin it around to there, and I'm going to do all of these at the one time. And I'm going to do something called drag soldering. And this is something which is apparently very bad. People say, don't drag solder, it's bad. I do it all the time. Um, so 
I have the flat part of the bevel facing down onto the pad with the curved, you know, this you know, angular bit up like this. I push it in to the little gap there. I get solder onto that and then I drag it across. And I get five nice little joins for the pins like that. So, and then, I mean, I might just put a little bit more flux on here and have another drag. I mean, as I did say before, some of these pins aren't ideal, but I do believe they're gonna work. So, right, we've done that one. We've now got enough pins to sort of hold it in place to go in and just do all of these as well. So, drag solder, drag solder. So these are the ugly ones here. I want to make sure they've got plenty of solder on them. Now, does anyone see that? I've got a bridge in there. Just in there, I've created a bridge. So that's something that you do have to be careful of when you're drag soldering. You've got to keep an eye out for that. Uh, when you do get a bridge, usually the easiest way to fix it is to push it in the other direction or put flux on it and then just run it past it again. So we're now two out of four sides. Going to need some flux here because we've got virtually none there. Ample amount. It looks like loads and loads and loads of flux, but it is, um, under a microscope, it is actually quite a small amount, um, despite how much it looks. There we go. Nice drag solder going on there. And... Last one. Now, what I usually do to check and make sure that these joins are all good is, because uh, the microscope is angled straight down, what I do is I actually, I'm just going to quickly change over here to this camera. This, these uh, uh, mounts these uh, of the microscope, you can actually adjust them and I can pull this all the way out like this till it's actually hanging over the edge of the desk. Then I can hold the um, uh, the board at an angle uh, and then I can do this I can look at that at an angle and see that we've got solder making contact with all those pads pins on pads everyone happy I'll do it from this side I'm actually just moving the board to get it in focus and that side, this was the ugly side here, that looks fine on that side. So then we've got that chip back in place. All right, uh, so, <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so what this proves is that if you're anti-dragging, drag, drag soldering, you're actually uh, basically a communist, so. Uh, um, when done, connect the serial cable from one classic Mac to another and create a mini local talk network. That's way to test it. Thank you very much, Steve. That's a very good suggestion. And I'm pretty sure I do have a serial cable floating around somewhere. So, um, came for the recapping, got the IC replacement. This is a good value stream. Uh, now I am going to uh, put the caps on. And this is where I need my little cheat sheet thing. And I... <laughs> Might need my caps as well. So these are all my little capacitors here. Um, okay. Oh dear. Oh dear. Um, right. So I am going to need one one microfarad 50 volt cap. It's one of the more common sizes for the Mac uh, capacitors, and. Um, but most of the boards only have one of them. So if you're stocking up on these capacitors, you don't need to buy too many of them because most of the time it's only like one per board. Uh, and that one microfarad 50 volt goes here, right here. So starting off with some flux and just making sure we're in focus and if we are. Then the capacitor, which I just put over here. I'm so good at losing capacitors. 
I put them down on the table and then I go to look for them and they're gone. There's a, there's, I think there's a little capacitor fairy that comes in here and steals capacitors off the bench while I'm looking in the microscope. Um, so, um, okay. Yeah, Rossman da drags soldiers all the time. Yeah, no, this is very true. I have seen him and I've also heard him uh, say that um, he has no issue with drag soldering either. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I guess if it was causing you great... The, the problem with drag soldering, there are two things. If you're working with a chip like... I'm just going to... Sorry, I digress here. But if you're working with a chip like this, I'm just going to whip it out, pop it under the microscope, and if you're soldering this onto a board, like that, if you drag solder that, you're going to pull those pins with it. So that's where drag soldering can be a problem. This is, uh, incidentally, this is a 68030... 33 megahertz chip. Um, so yeah, if you're drag soldering with a chip like that, you're going to probably get yourself into strife. Uh, those pins bend incredibly easily. Um, and the other danger with drag soldering is, of course, leaving little bridges behind, you know, accidentally bridging two pins. But as long as you're careful and you, you know, you sort of practice at it and everything, I've really got no issue with it at all. Um, okay, I was putting a, uh, a capacitor on and focusing the camera. Right. We're all holding together. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I've got 16 viewers here at the moment. I hope they're not 16 of the most bored people on the planet. Um, trying to move through, trying to move through. Let's, let's speed this up. We're nearly done. Hey, you're nearly done. Okay. These particular capacitors are about the same size as these uh, pads. These are tantalum capacitors replacing the electrolytic. Uh, the positive is on the, the stripe is the positive side. Um, and I have to position this very carefully so that I can get enough solder on both sides of this component. So I've got some solder that I've put onto the end. Oh, didn't get it onto the pad. Got some solder that I put onto the end of my soldering iron, and I've got lots of flux, and that flux is going to help that solder flow onto the pad and onto the component. I said, onto the pad, I said. Right, now, apart from the fact that I've got way too much solder on the end of that, it has now connected to the pad. I can give that a nudge, and you can see that it's held on on one side. So I'm just going to give this a bit, a bit of a wipe, just pull some of that excess solder off. That's all good. Uh, if we didn't want to be here, we wouldn't be. I do appreciate that. Um, it's, it is nice to hear. Um, but I still, yeah, I mean, I hope you all, you've all got other things here able to entertain yourself with while I get boring, you know, you're sort of watching the telly or something like that. Um, right. There we go. Oh, I'm almost off camera, sorry, do I? Okay. Gives that a nudge. Yep, that's now held on on both sides. So that one's good. So that is our one and only one microfarad 50 volt in place. Then the rest of the surface mount electrolytics are 47 microfarad 16 volt, arguably the most common size. So 10 of them. Piffle. 10. Far out. Right. I might do them in little batches because if I pull 10 out and put them on the desk, the capacitor fairy is going to take you know, at least two of them away. So I'm going to just put some flux there, there, there there and there. Now, there's another thing I mentioned in, what, in one of my other uh, streams. I like your demeanor more than Rossman's. Thanks for that. I mean, I could just start insulting people if you like. Um, you know, I can, uh, I, I'd like to, actually, isn't that a terrible thing, but I shouldn't insult other people that do live streams. Um, Rossman has taught me a lot over the years. Um, I started working on modern Macs. I actually moved across to the vintage later on. Um, and I started with a lot of um, the stuff that uh, Rossman taught me. So I think it's wonderful that he shares his knowledge. Um, I think, you know, it is fantastic. But as we know, uh, he does do a lot of stuff, you know, more kind of just, uh, uh, I guess, trying to make stuff interesting and stuff like that. And uh, sometimes if you're just there to learn about a particular problem, it might get a little bit, a little bit hard. Um, uh, okay, everyone watching needs to ask themselves two questions. Number one, have you dropped to your knees and thanked the good Lord for Brancus Creations today? Isn't that not? It's a lovely thing to say. Thank you very much. And number two, have you clicked the thumbs up button yet? 
Thank you. That would be appreciated if you do. Uh, just wait till Bruce gets 750,000 subs, though. He'll become a political mess, too. Yeah, I'll just sort of get in here and start talking about all of my uh, sort of uh, political beliefs and whatnot. That'll be great. Everyone will love to watch that. I can't see myself ever doing that, to be honest. I just don't think there's any place for it in uh, a stream like this, in a informational stream like this. I, I just don't think politics has any place in it at all, to be honest. But, you know, maybe that's how I get the extra subs, eh? Right, so, here we go. I've just, uh, I put the, uh, the flux down. I've positioned three of the capacitors on that flux. Flux is just holding them in position while I do this work. Um, and I am then just going to solder these into place. These ones have a lot more uh, pad on either side. So um, they, uh, they are a lot easier to actually put on. The main thing with me is just making sure that they're straight because um, I like, I just, when you look at the board afterwards, if they're all on straight, it just looks much nicer. Looks more professional. Okay, that's on there. Just going to hold that down now, make sure it's flat. Just rubbing it like that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the speed that that solder melts when I'm working with it is because I do use a really, really hot iron. Um, but the, the thing is that I... I move the iron very quickly so it doesn't sit there because the thing is that pads are adhered, excuse me, I just burnt them, and pads are adhered to the board via an adhesive and too much heat melts that adhesive and that's how pads then end up getting lift, uh, lifted off. So, um, um, so I, you know, sort of apply a lot of heat, solder does its job, gets to where it's going and then I get the soldering iron out nice and quick smart. Just again, just I, I do it once to get the solder on there. Then I do it again with the tweezers pushing down on the top of the uh, capacitor uh, to make sure it's flush on the board. And you may notice I have only been doing one side of each of these, and that's because I do one side, I flip them over, and then I do the other side of each of them. It's just a lot quicker to do it that way. Holding that in position, almost off camera. Sorry about that. Trying to line it up with the other capacitor. Uh, and right all right so spinning it around um and doing the second side see if there's still enough solder on this and the answer is no a little bit more solder. I just keep, I'm doing this off camera, but I'm basically just, what I do is I've got my, my, my stick of solder here. I grab my iron, I, I just, I virtually cut it and just the end sucks it up. So, and then I just do that. So that's how I measure the amount of solder that I'm using. I just sort of grab it like this, cut, and then just that way I've got a kind of measured amount of solder that I'm using. And last one here. Do you see the solder ball? I see the solder ball. Nasty little solder ball. Off you come. <coughs> All right, so, just always, always do this, always tap the ends of them, make sure they're on solid, and, uh, and before I move on. Um, okay, so I use 400C typically, yeah, see, uh, the other thing with soldering irons is the, the temperature that you set it to is not always the same from soldering iron to soldering iron. Um, you know, I have this one set at like 450 sometimes, 430 other times. And um, the, um, you know, that is, a lot of people would say that's too hot. And, you know, look, it probably is. I mean, it's just the way I solder. I'm used to that, that way. But I wouldn't necessarily say that just for beginners, start at 450 degrees Celsius, you're likely to sort of, you know, burn pads off, so. Um, all right, so um, we've got another one here, which is our little, well, I mean, they're all from here on in 47 microfarads, so they're all nice and easy. These are quite quick and easy to put on, so for those that are just sitting there, oh my goodness, how long do we have to wait? 
uh, we are very close, believe it or not. Uh, I mean, unless I go on a tangent. Um, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm going to go on a tangent at this stage. I think uh, I think all the tangents have been done. Um, however, no, I'm only joking. Okay, solve it on there. I'm just going to tip it this way. Uh, just always remember, folks, um, you know, don't be afraid to move the board around. Don't be twisting and contorting yourself into positions, um, you know, sort of working around the board. Board's nice and light. Moves easily. Move the board. Get your hands comfortable. Uh, okay, uh, just to check and make sure that I haven't uh, missed anything. Once again, if, if you do ask a question and uh, it's, you know, I haven't answered it, um, you know, wait a while, I'll ask it again because I am, uh, I, I am definitely going to miss some of the comments. Um, another thing I mentioned in my previous stream is the fact that we are replacing electrolytic capacitors with tantalums. And one of the big differences, apart from the fact that one is electrolytic and one is tantalum, that's one really big difference. But apart from that, if you have a look at the underside of these caps, I'm going to just plonk one here on the RAM slot. That you see the pins of the tantalum. And then this is one of our blown up electrolytics. And you can see the pins on the electrolytic. They are much thinner pins. These are really wide. Now, because we are putting something in place that was never really <clears throat> designed for that, We've got these thin <clears throat> pads and we've got these thick pins. And so you have to be careful that if that thick pin is going to touch something other than the pad, make sure that that, that is coated. Um, so I'll give an example later on, but sometimes when that coating is scraped away, uh, we just need to make sure that that wide um, pin of the tantalum cap doesn't touch an exposed bit of trace that it's not meant to be touching. I hope all of that made sense because it sounded, particularly when I got about halfway through it, like gibberish. Okay, there's that one. <coughs> Excuse me. Just gonna get at this from this angle. Uh, there's another one. Move on. This particular section of the board that I'm looking at here, quite a few of the um, SE30s I've worked on in the past, this particular area has suffered really badly from the leakage of the cap that's here. So um, uh, I just mentioned that this is one of the reasons why when I looked at this one, I said, "Oh, this one's really clean because." That area there was was really nice. This is another area that often suffers very badly from the uh, leakage, um, even though it's only got one cap there. Okay, another little 47 microfarad cap. Um, <clears throat> uh, someone did ask me the other day, when you're buying replacement caps, what should I be looking for? I mean, if you jump on to, I'd buy it from RS Components, but if you jump on to Mouser or any of those, uh, and uh, choosing them, you might say, okay, well, it's, I know it's a 47 microfarad, 16 volt tantalum. And you go, okay, no worries. You type that in. And the next thing you know, um, you've got 50 different choices of capacitor to choose from. Now, the sorts of things you would be choosing from are brand. Um, and, you know, there are various different brands for those. Um, I buy, I think it's AVX, I think it is. There's Kemet as well. <coughs> they're they're well-known brands. They're good brands. Um the other thing you're looking for are things like tolerance. Uh, generally with tolerance, the lower the number, the better. Um, you're also looking for price. I mean, you don't want to be stung too hard with the cost of these things. And, and of course, the most important thing are the dimensions of the cap. You've got to make sure that you buy a cap that's going to fit in the space. And they're generally, you know, certainly on the, on the sites I am, they're just measured in millimetres. And, you know, you just need to make sure that the one you get is a suitable size to replace the old one. Um, I do intend to put the part numbers of the capacitors I use on my website in the not too distant future. So um, that is something that will be coming. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also plan to do a video in the not too distant future. This won't be a live stream, but this will be a video of uh, me uh, going through all of the stuff in my workshop. 
It sounds incredibly contrived and self-indulgent, but the thing is that um, over the years, I've ended up finding all sorts of really cool things, like, I mean, stuff like uh, this uh, electrically conductive paint, which is really great for fixing things like remote controls and stuff like that. Things like um, um, thread locker. I've gone on a tangent, haven't I? Thread locker, you know, for keeping the screws in place. Now, the, the problem is that most thread lockers are referred to as anaerobic, which means that they only work if, if there's no air around them. So you put them on the screw, you screw them in, they're deprived of air, and then they, they go hard. But sometimes you might want a thread locker that you want to put on the outside of a, of a um, uh, you know, sort of a, a screw, you, maybe like a tamper-evident type one. And there's this stuff, which is, it's like a nail polish. I mean, it looks like nail polish. I mean, it may even be nail polish, but it's certainly not sold as nail polish. And it's very much like it, and you can paint this on, and it goes rock hard, um, and uh, and you can paint it on the outside, unlike these sort of anaerobic type thread lockers. So, you know, I've just you know over the years I've just collected all these different goos and stuff like that that work really well for particular jobs. So I will be doing a video going through all of that sort of stuff. So, won't that be exciting? Um, right, we have one one more surface mount capacitor to go. No. Let's try four more surface capacitors to go, but you know, um, they're um, they're easy ones. So, uh, question yes, part numbers okay, yep, no worries, part numbers are coming. <coughs> um, JJ Brewbaker, I just need to tell you that my nickname is Brewbaker, so how about that? Um, I have some, yep, yep, excellent, good stuff. Uh, one thing always struck me some boards have a mixed SMT electronic caps and tantalum. Is that purely a cost decision? I always thought tantalums are preferable. What's your take on that? Um, tantalum is rare. Tantalum is a very rare metal. It's about as rare as I think it's uranium. Uh, it's certainly a lot rarer than, rarer than another me, a lot of metals out there. And so with tantalum comes a cost. Tantalum also has a limit um, of, um, you know, sort of capacitance and voltage ratings. When you start getting to big capacitors, um, electrolytics are generally your only choice because there aren't other types of capacitor available. Um, and uh, so it, it's probably a cost thing. Um, the, look, there could be other reasons and someone with more experience in sort of electronics engineering might be able to answer that. Um, but at the time, when you look at a lot of the Macs of this vintage, when they did have tantalums on there, they were only little tiny ones. And that could have been to do with the cost of tantalum capacitors at the time. So, um, yeah, and uh, uh, what's the second choice if tantalum runs out? There are some other options um, other than tantalum, and I can't remember at the moment. Was it nubium or something like that? Um, but, yeah, there are, there are definitely other types of ones, and then there are sort of hybrid-type capacitors as well, ones that sort of don't have a lot of the leakage problems and stuff like that. But anyhow... Um, tantalums have a tendency to blow up if they're used outside of their spec, which is never nice. But if they're used within spec, they're incredibly reliable. And you can basically tell that when you look at some of these vintage boards that are 30 plus years old and have tantalum capacitors on them that are just quite happily still sitting there doing their job while we replace all the electrolytics. If you can get tantalum equivalent, then it would be preferable. Um, I would say for these sorts of jobs, the answer would be yes. When you start getting into the um, bigger sizes, no. Um, I've found that I did a, I actually recently recapped a Nintendo 64, and I recapped that all with electrolytics. And the reason was that there were a handful of them on there that were really expensive as a tantalum alternative. So I just bought very good quality Panasonic electrolytic surface mount caps and used those. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that, that the surface mount electrolytic capacitors being made today are probably um, are going to last longer than these old ones did, um, just in terms of improvements in manufacturing and stuff like that. Um, so putting that there. Starship Troopers quote. Did I do one? When did I do that? Oh, would you like to know more? Yes, that is definitely a Starship Troopers quote. I love that movie. My wife hates it. I have to watch it by myself. 
Okay. Not everyone gets Paul Verhoeven. Okay, so this is what I was talking about before with, see how there's a trace running right down the middle of that there? If that uh, that uh, coating had been exposed, I would be recoating it before I put this capacitor on. So I would just be worried about its proximity proximity to these pads. But anyhow, it just that was one of my tangents. Just following that up. This one looks crooked. There we go. Okay. Quadrant 950 is all tantalum by default, believe it or not. Yes, the Quadrant 950, that's right. And same with the Quadrant 700. The Quadrant 700 is all tantalum. Um, so uh, that's a nice thing about the 700. It doesn't need recapping. I think the power supplies do, but not the logic board. Um, right. A little bit more solder on that. There we go. That was a little bit too much, but it's still fine. All right. So now the last ones we've got are these three near the uh, little power connector. Uh, I'm just going to have a quick look, see if I can see any potential problems with, you know, again, when I'm, I was talking before about those pins being wider, here's a really good example. If that trace was exposed, there would be a real risk of that wide tantalum pin touching that, that there. So if that was exposed, I would be painting it with UV, um, uh, UV coating. UV coating is basically just this green stuff you're looking at here, but you can buy it in a syringe and you just sort of paint it on and then you dry it with a UV light. You can even use the sun if it's sunny, which it's not here at the moment. Um, and uh, I'm just going to get a bit of fluff there. Get away fluff. And then, um, and then that would coat it and then protect it when I put it on there. Uh, the old... Um, I tell you, one of the um, the power supplies, and I mentioned this in one of my videos before, one of the worst power supplies in the Max, and I mean, someone might know of a worse one, but one of the worst is the 2SI. They are a shocker. Um, they have two little surface mount electrolytic capacitors on this little daughter board, uh, as well as all these leaky electrolytic um, sort of radial through hole caps on the main power supply. And I tell you, if you have a 2SI that's still working with the original power supply, you go out and buy a lottery ticket because those things are just an accident waiting to happen. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, if you do have a 2SI and you haven't recapped your power supply, get it done. Right, so we're down to our final three. My normal thing, putting on some flux, hold it in position. Solder on the end of the soldering iron tip and solder. Push it down to keep it flat. There we go. Move on to the next one. Just going to need a little bit more solder and hold this in position. Uh, another thing I, uh, I sort of should mention again, this is having watched some other people do recapping on live streams, uh, is uh, the tip of your soldering iron constantly getting dirty um, and or going black. Um, I frequently, as in like, you know, about every second or third solder that I do, I stab my soldering iron into one of these little copper ball things. And stabbing them in that does the metal of, of these scrapes the, uh, the outside and the copper helps draw the solder off the end of the iron. So after I've stabbed that in a few times, you have a look at the tip, you can see it's all shiny. And you can't because it's out of focus, but see how it's all shiny there? So you just kind of got to get it, get into the habit while you're doing this stuff of just giving it a stab in here every now and again uh, while you're working. And that just keeps the tip nice and clean. And that's virtually the only maintenance you need unless you're someone who only fires up your soldering iron every now and again. Because if you leave your iron not being used for a really long period of time, the tip can get ugly. So, but if you're using your soldering iron semi-regularly, and you're just stabbing it as you're working with it, that tip, um, you know, sort of will stay quite good. Um, yeah, I have so many machines to recap that it's not funny. Yeah, that's, that's a pro yeah, it's talk, talk to uh, uh, Steve Mac84 about that. Um, he's got lots and lots and lots of computers that need recapping. So uh, um, I love watching vintage repairs. Well, I'm glad because I love doing them. So, um, 
Uh, it is actually, it's a, an incredibly rewarding thing when you're doing this stuff. I mean, I do this, I do this and I charge people for it and that's because it takes my time. Um, and you know, if I'm doing this and I'm not doing other work, I'm not getting paid because I'm self-employed. Uh, I'm, I'm full-time as work as a programmer, um, a web programmer. And, um, um, but I do love this. And of course, it's so incredibly rewarding when you have a computer that is not working. Uh, you do this, you recap it, you clean it, and then it's working. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really rewarding stuff. And it's very easy to get addicted to this as a hobby. Um, because, you know, I mean, who doesn't like fixing things, you know, taking something that it's not working and you're sort of ultimately future proofing it so that you can keep using it for years to come. Uh, a lot of fun. Oh, we made it to the two hour mark. There we go. Okay. Two, oh, gee, yeah, it's two hours 21, but actually probably, let me, yeah, something like that. My, my, uh, OBS is saying 2021, but, uh, I don't know if that's, that's probably since I pressed the start streaming button, which I did before it started. Um, okay, so that's all of the caps on. So as usual, I always do my little check. I make sure I've got the right caps in the right place. I always make sure that I've got the right, right polarity and I always make sure that they are stuck on. So um, I've got my positive here. I've got my little stripe, so that's fine. They're stuck on on both sides. <coughs> we've got here. Hitting, hitting, hitting. Positive, 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 positive. Yep, that's all good. Not there, did it, did it. That's good. Uh, down here. Bum, 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 bum. Yep, he's stuck on. He's stuck on. Okay, so we're all looking good there. Now we have the um, the other exciting bit, and that's where we need to put on the axial caps. Uh, is that a solder blob next to the C10 label inside the C? Uh, 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 uh. C9, C10, 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 is that, is that C10? C10, I can't see, oh yeah, C10. That there is not a solder blob, that is a little bit of crunchy, sticky corrosion. Uh, it's, you know, it's one of the things that when you're looking at this, obviously, um, <laughs> I'm doing something you can't see at the moment. Isn't that fun? Um, if you're, um, I'm doing, you know, sort of when I'm, um, I'm looking at through this, I get much better vision than you get through the camera capture, because you know it's not going through a CCD and get converted into a digital image. I'm seeing an analog image, so it's lovely and crystal clear. And so, um, so anyhow, yes, no, that, that that wasn't a solder blob. But thank you very much for pointing that out. I always do like to know if there is a solder blob hiding there. So. Uh, next step is I've got my uh, cheat sheet here and the two capacitors I need to replace are a 220 microfarad 16 volt and a 470 microfarad 16 volt axial capacitor. Now I've got my axial capacitors here and I have them grouped into voltage. Um, so they're both uh, 16s, but I'm going to do something a little bit funny. I'm going to put... I've got, it's got actual, it's got actual, here we go, here we are, it's in my actual one. I'm just going to grab this, so I keep my caps in these things. Um, so um, I'm actually going to replace these ones, instead of 16 volt caps, I'm going to replace them with 25 volt caps. They're actually the same size as the old 16 volt. I mean, I could either put on 16 volt ones that, which are smaller, I can put on ones that are the same size, there's plenty of space on the board and have a higher uh, voltage rating. Now, uh, you don't want to ever change the capacitance, but it's okay to go up in voltage. You don't go down in voltage, but it's okay to go, go up in voltage, but don't go up too much. So anyhow, that's just uh, uh, something worth mentioning there. So I said 470, so 470, 25, there's one, and 220, 220, 25, there's one. Um, I'll close these up, because I don't want, to knock that over and send little capacitors all over the place. That would be very bad. It would not be good. Um, okay. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. 
You're a web programmer, dude. My cousin has a cafe and needs a WordPress site. Can you help out? Yes, that's a little inside joke that we have. Um, I usually tell people that I'm a programmer. I don't tell people that I'm a web programmer. And that's because most of the time when you say to people you work with websites, the next thing you know is you get someone saying to you exactly that. Uh, my cousin has a cafe and he needs a WordPress site. Can you help? And I don't do that sort of stuff. Um, I do sort of uh, more sort of custom developments, uh, integrating systems onto websites so that when you go onto a website, you've got, you know, fancy tools and stuff like that. So please check out my website, certificatemagic.com. Customized PDF certificates. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's the inside joke uh, with that one about um, that I have spoken to Jay about before. So, yes. Um, um, all right. So... Uh, when I'm doing the axial capacitor, what I'm basically wanting to do is bend the pins so that they go sort of straight down when I put the capacitor on there. So um, I'm kind of getting, and just it doesn't have to be exact, but I'm doing it as by eye measurement um, when I, uh, actually I was going to change the camera, but stuff it. Um, I'll just change that to the microscope. Um, go to the microscope big. So, um, so let me just... So I'm just sort of trying to work out where to bend these from so that those pins go more or less straight down. Oh, and the other thing I do, because I'm not, I'm not a, an a-hole, I bend the pins so that the, the, the um, measurements, the actual readings, what they are, uh, the voltage and the capacitance are visible on the top. Uh, some people, when they mount them, they do that with those readings down underneath. And that's a real pain when you're looking at a board trying to work out what to replace it with and you look down and you can't read them, you've got to bend the capacitor or cut it off to see what it says. So I always like to put my capacitors on so that you can read what they are. So bending my pins here, a different camera would be really good for demonstrating this other than something in between this camera and this camera, but I don't have that. So electrolytic capacitors, unlike tantalums, they've got a little stripe that points towards negative. Tantalums, the stripe is on the positive, electrolytic stripes on the negative. So with this one here, where we have a plus on the board, we want the stripe pointing in the other direction. Uh, this one here is my 220. So um, I have my negative going that way. So I'm gonna put one through there and one through there. And then when I put this through, I'm gonna push it down, none of which you can see because it's too small. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, the microscope's really not helpful for this bit. So I've put that, I've just put that there, tucked in, and then on the other side, I'll just get these pins and I give them a little bit of a bend so they don't fall out. Just a little bend like that. You can't see it. Bent. Just bent there. So there we go. Um, then let's move on to the other cap. Uh, this one is a, a fatter one. This is the 470. And once again, just going to try and bend these pins so that they line up with the holes and I nearly did that horrible trick of making it so that you can't read them. So I'm just gonna bend those bendy. I mean, it doesn't have to be exact. I mean, these things don't need to be perfect, but um, I just like it to be as neat as possible. So that's negative, positive. There we go. That one, I got that, that one, I got virtually spot on. Okay, bend those pins so they're now bent and they're going to hold in and then I just need to solder them from the underside. So that's where we can go back to our microscope. Um, right. Um, now, that's not in camera. So now, I need to move it. now this is going to be a little bit hard to keep in focus because when I put the board up like this, it's at a bit of an angle, so half, you know, might, it might drift in and out of focus all the time. All right, so there's our little pin sticking out. Grab me some solder and put this here. I'm getting, trying to get the pad and the pin hot, and then I just put it in like this, and there we go. Neat, tidy, and soldered. There we go. This is the one that's uh, attached to the ground. This one takes some heating. There we go. It's a nice little blob. It's a big blob, but still, that's fine. And we move across to this one. And 
Now, obviously, putting on big components like this, you really don't need a microscope, but it really is just the easiest way for me to demonstrate this as I'm doing it. Okay. And then the old chopping off the excess, which we will do like this. Grab my little side cutters and just a little snoop, and a little snoop, and a little snoop, and a last little snoop. Okay, so this is what now I would consider ultimately finished apart from cleaning. So I want to test this now um, because I think that's the only fair thing to do for everyone who's been watching it this long. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, there needs to be some sort of reward. Now I'm just checking to make sure I got the polarity correct on those um, axial capacitors. By the way, with the axial capacitors, they are still available. You can get them from places like uh, um, RF components that I use here in Australia or from, you know, Mouser or whoever those other ones are. Uh, but you just have to make sure when you're doing a search for them, search for axial capacitors. Um, and they'll, they'll come up and you'll see they're the ones with a little barrel in the middle and the two coming out from the side. Because if you get a, um, a radial and you want to put it in place of this, you've got to bend one pin right back over onto the other side. And it'll work, but it just looks awful. So, you know, not good enough. Test it, test it. Yes, I know. We all want it tested. So, um, look, a prudent thing for me to do would be to go around and check really closely that everything's okay and there aren't any little solder balls anywhere. But I like living on the edge. I'm not going to stick all eight of these... Um, uh, of these um, ram sims back in because that then I've got to take them all out again. So I'm going to put in, I'm just going to pan down here while I prep this board. I'm going to put my little ROM sim in and then I'll get four in here because you've got to basically put these in in fours, um, in banks of four. So there's like, you know, bank A and bank B. So you've got to have four matching. Uh, they don't have to be the same. You can have like four ones in one and you can have, you know, four fours in another. Um, but, uh, um, oh, look, Jay's in there for the long haul. That's awesome. Um, am, I, am I stopping, um, you know, UT99, Jay? Is that, am I uh, killing that bit of fun for you? So, uh, that one's the same. That one's the same. That one's the same. That one's the same. Okay, so I've got a little matched pair, matched um, foursome here. So um, that's bank A and bank B. And I think it is, if you've only got them in one, they should be in bank A. And you watch. That could be wrong. But I think it's right. I'm pretty sure it's bank A. If you're going to have a bank empty, you have bank B empty. Uh, it'll let me know if it's wrong. It certainly will let me know. Bup, 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 bup. When I put these in, I always give them a wobble like that before snapping them up, just to know that they're properly seated in that little cradle. So I just push them in and just wobble them back and forwards and then pull them up like that. Um, I think the UT99 ship sailed long ago. This was far too interesting. Oh, thank you very much. I, I, I apologize to other people who might be playing UT99 that are missing out on Jay's um, presence there. Um, and last time I played Unreal Tournament, uh, Jay killed me, oh, at least, what, 30, 40 times, I think? Um, but having said that, that was the first time I ever played it, so. Um, all right, so, to test it, we need to get this big thing back, don't we? Oh, oh these things are heavy. Oh, oh, Merlin's beard. Okay, up she goes. I'm just going to do this to try and move this a bit out of the way. So I've got a bit more space here. Um, and I'll switch on some light, hey? Is that? No, that's, that gives me all flickery, wavery stuff, so I'm not going to do that. Um, all right, so I've got to put this board back in. Uh, have you had to replace many of the plastic SIM carriers? Like, I have replaced one, and it's a nightmare of a job. Um, I would that SIM carrier would have to be absolutely, you know, ratted for me to replace it because it's an awful job to remove them. Here's a job that I did recently, which is, was not a fun one. I have to replace, this is a PowerBook 
3600. Uh, I had to replace this PCM CIA carrier thingy holder and it is soldered on by all these little solder pin little pins in here, hundreds of them. And I had to desolder every single one of those to then take the carry the dead carrier off and replace it with a good one. And that was enough to send me insane. That's why I am like I am now. Right, so we're going to connect up this sound thingy, the sound lead. So I find it easier to connect that up that one up first because it is uh, uh, longer. Then I will usually just get the power plug. I'll get it in as far as I can, but I can always push it in a little bit further once the board's in. You can't see any of this, and I do apologise. There's nothing I can really do about that. Uh, eh, eh. Okay, so that's sort of, it's more or less in at the moment. Now we need to get the board in, and we do that in the reverse of the way we took it out. So we slot it in. Uh, I, I, I want to go the other way. It's because this is not mirrored for me, so I'm seeing everything backwards. So um, that goes in there, like that, into that, into that slot there. And then we line up these holes here with the little holes there. And then you just give it a, a push, a push, a push until it goes in to those little slots. I say, until it goes in, I'm gonna to have to spin it around, sorry. You get the general gist of it, but I do need to be able to see what I'm doing. There we go, it's in. Okay, so they're in now, those slots are lined up here, and then I can push those down, so you can see it's lift up and pushing them down. So they're pushed down now, get that in place. I will be doing a teardown video of an SE30, I've already started work on it uh, at some stage, which will go through all of this in detail. Um, okay, so I've got to now just try and push that, um, that plug in. Right. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's in, but I might need to stand it up and just shove it down with a screwdriver or something like that, or, or a toothbrush. How about a toothbrush? Yeah, it's not quite on. There we go. Oop. Yeah, that's in now. That looks in, yep. Okay, so then I've got to reconnect the floppy and the scuzzy. Now, again, if you're doing this the first time, take this bit off. It makes life so much easier, and I really should take it off myself right now, uh, but I'm not gonna. It'll take too long. So, pushing in the little floppy cable here, I know you can't see any of this. I'll just describe it. I'll, I'll draw a picture for you later. Um, and then I've got to put in the scuzzy cable, which is right next to the floppy cable, and that just goes in there. When you're putting these cables in, I find it's easier to leave the computer upright than on its side. SCSI cable is connected. This is the original quantum hard drive in this, so it'd be interesting to see if that still works. Uh, as usual, inside these, particularly with the SE and the SE30, uh, this board on the back, which hangs off the end of the CRT, um, it's so easy to bump this and then snap off. Can you see that there? Oh, you probably can't. Can you see that little glass like little knob little nipple that's where they seal these they seal it into a, as a vacuum and um, you know uh, if you bend this board on the back a little bit that just snaps off and then you just hear all the air rushing in and it's no longer a vacuum and it won't work anymore um, okay so uh, just a quick little um, uh, check up here uh, uh, let me have a look. Uh, just looking, hunting up these were absolutely marvelous machines back in the day. It reminds me of the way I saw two effects in the first time. It's interesting. The two effects, uh, I agree. I, the two effects was just just dazzled me at the time. It, that thing was just so fast. It's a pain now because you can't get RAM for them. Um, I, I, I think you know FX RAM is really really rare. So uh, as rare as rock and roll stuff. Um, Okay, so board's in. Uh, everything is connected here. SCSI is connected. It's all that. Now, I you know, generally don't recommend that you start these up with the back off, but I'm going to do that because, uh, you know, cause, just because. Um, I've got a mouse here. This is one of my favorite Mac 
nieces. Um, this particular one here. Uh, I've always liked the design of this one here. And here we go. This is gonna this is gonna divide people. This came in two versions. It came in a version with a light plastic ball, and the other one came with a grey heavy one with a, the, um, a metal ball inside it with rubber around the outside. <coughs> Excuse me. And Jay, don't start about your pucks. Um, I always liked uh, the light ball, but most people I've spoken to actually much preferred the heavy ball. So anyhow, but this is, again, one of my favourite mice. And um, so there we go. I'm going to just plug that in just so that I can click on things if I have to. Make sure that we've got a reasonable view here. Um, this will probably flicker. These are at like about, they refresh at about sort of on a 60.1 one-th um, uh, of a second or something like that. Um, when I film these in my, um, in my pre-prepared videos, I shoot them with my big flashy camera, which has an option to synchronize the shutter speed of the camera to screens. So I can actually go in and set it to the exact refresh rate of these screens so that I get them beautifully sort of smooth. Um, but I'm not going to have that luck with this camera. This is probably going to end up looking all flickery. Okay. Da -da -da -da, drum roll, people. I'm about to press the button. Da -da 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 okay. Ready? Ah, oh, did you hear that? Did you hear the chime? It was a chime. It was that. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with this at all. It's perfect. It's look, it's even starting up. Now, it may be apparent, it may or may not be apparent, that this has some video issues. Now, I would think around about, uh, probably about a 90% chance that after this has been in the ultrasonic cleaner, this will be looking perfect. If not, I'll go back to those, um, uh, oh, it's, look, this is all, this is all, um, the hard drive still works, and this has all got uh, whoever's data on this who owned it last, so uh, I hope there's nothing personal comes up here, but yeah, I would think that cleaning will fix this, I don't think there'll be any problem afterwards, after cleaning, um, if there is, I'll be checking all of those uh, graphics chips. Now I'm going to just point all those out now. I'm going to pull it apart again and just quickly show it, and then I'll wrap up this uh, stream by putting this into the ultrasonic cleaner to keep Jay happy. And then we'll, once it starts making that horrible noise, I'll finish the stream. Um, so going to, if I can, just can I even do this? Can I shut it down? Can I find the... Oh, there we go. Special. No, is it that one? I can't find it. Shut down. Yes. Restart. Shut down. There we go. So, really, really common problem with these old Macs is because of the capacitors hovering directly above all those graphic chips. They get that, um, you know, sort of the, uh, <coughs> um, sort of all those graphics issues. Um, I don't think it's a problem with the, the VRAM chips. I have spare re VRAM chips. I have replaced them in the past, I think, but anyhow. Um, uh, now, th these, this is now a very good time for discharging the CRT because I've just had it working and that CRT has all been charged up. So, I'm going to, once again, I have this connected to my big metal thing and I will just, oh, and I'm standing on my mic cable. There we go. And then I'm just going to lift that up there. And no. now there was no crack there at all, and that's because I'm pretty sure these Macs do actually have a um, bleeder resistor which does automatically discharge them. So, but you always do this anyway, better to be safe than sorry. And I actually do a little bit of a double check with these, I do the, I do that the, um, uh, the discharge with the discharge tool, and then while holding this like this, I don't actually touch the, the anodes, I then just touch those anodes on here this little metal bit around here which is a ground and i just tap it on there so it's almost like a little double check to make sure that that's discharged so anyhow <coughs> we're all good so i didn't need to take that out but i did so there we go discharge it if you haven't seen my video on discharging a crt please watch it it might save your life if you decide to open one of these up 
So very quickly, going to whip this board back out again. At least we know that the majority of it works. We've just got some graphics issues. And as I say, I reckon there's about a 90% chance that will sort out with a clean. Um, so the board comes out once again. Quite tight, this one. My, my one, the board just bloody slips out easily. So oh, I didn't have the plug all the way in. I wonder if it was that. The plug was actually hanging out a little bit. Maybe one of those pins wasn't making contact. Oh, it's got to be clean anyway, so what are you going to do? Um, right. Come on. Get my big fat hands in here. Ah, geez, my nice slender piano with pianist fingers would be good for doing this. Not my little um, sausage fingers. It would look like I'm wearing a boxing glove, even though I'm not. Okay. That goes back down. Yanking my microphone cable. Let's hope the sound still works. Check one, two, check one, two, 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 check. Okay. So, these come back off. Uh, flux equals conductive. Um, no, actually, this particular flux is not conductive. Um, I'm sure there are conductive ones out there, but this one is not. Um, you can actually leave this flux on the board without any need to clean it off. But um, there are definitely some conductive ones out there. So this is specifically a no clean flux. Now, of course, um, you know, I am going to clean it off because it's unsightly, but you know. So I'm just going to quickly jump back. I'm going to bring this back up to my pretty face. There we go. There's a reward for everyone. And just uh, flick this back over to microscope. Um, and uh, as I said before, we've got this, this is this leaky capacitor here. This is, and of course, look, we've got some solder balls here. These could be, these could be contributing, but um, I'm going to sort of clean all this out. All of this sort of corrosion here, and there could be breaks in some of these traces, and there's gunk around here. This, all of this row of chips, this row all the way along here, these are all to do with the video and the row below it. That there is one VRAM chip. Right below it is another VRAM chip. Um, and, uh, and then all these video, 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 up and down, video, all of this is video. So, you know, generally, you know, the problem's going to be around there somewhere. And the sort of things that I look for when I have video problems are making sure that there aren't any broken traces around here. I did a, a, a SEMA CMAC video, um, a, you know, a, a SEMA CMAC uh, a issue with a, um, an SE30 a while ago. And in that, there were broken traces on one or two of these, uh, of these chips along here. And once I repaired the traces, away it went. So, um, um, and yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. This on oh, this is uh this is the video ROM chip here. It's a socketed chip here. That's the video ROM just there. Um, now, when I clean this, what I generally do with these is I take the socket chip out, and I might even take this video RAM out. We'll see. But I take the socket chip out um, mainly because these Motorola chips have got a little bit of black printing um, on them. Can we see that in focus? They've got this little black printing, this Motorola and the speed. That black stuff comes off in the ultrasonic cleaner, and I don't like giving it back to the people. The stuff comes off the crystals as well. See, that's a right there, a thing there. That's a, um, a crystal, uh, uh, what do you call them? Crystal, God, I've forgotten the word. Never mind. Um, that they have a printing on them, that printing often comes off in the ultrasonic cleaner as well. There's not much you can do about it. And the ultrasonic cleaner is just the best way to get these things clean. So, you know, I just do whatever I can to try and protect the board. But, um, you know, sometimes things like that do come off. So, um, that is prob... Oh, actually, no, I, I did promise I was going to switch on the uh, ultrasonic cleaner for Jay. And I didn't do it last time. And, you know... No, it, it, Crystal's not what I'm thinking of. Crystal... Oscillator. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, three in a row said oscillator, um, and that is the word I was looking for, oscillator. Uh, Mr. Dictionary left my head for a while. Um, okay. Right. I'm, uh, you can't see it at the moment, and I'm not going to show you because it's not something I want to demonstrate or display. 
Um, I am lifting off the, uh, very carefully lifting off the socketed 6803C CPU, and I'm doing it in a way that some people might say, my God, don't do it that way. Sorry, my goodness, don't do it that way. You don't want to blaspheme on the stream. Um, and so I am not showing you what I'm doing. Uh, but just, you know, take my word for it that I'm doing a lovely job and this CPU will be fine when I'm finished. There it is. There's the little pins underneath. Um, and here it is going to my little special location here so that I don't lose it. Um, so that is now going to go into the ultrasonic cleaner. Um, and <laughs> Merlin's beard, don't do it that way. Um, I mean, look, I do have like a sort of IC pullers and stuff like that, but the way I do it, I just prefer it. So you know, it just works better and I, I don't bend pins. So, um, so um, ultrasonic cleaner, how am I going to do this? Can I even, can I even view it? Uh, I'm going to spin around and you get to see more of my pretty shed. You get to see all of my not working laptops here. Actually, I think that one does actually work. Um, and this is the ultrasonic cleaner. It is set to around about 50 degrees Celsius, the water inside it. This uh, ultrasonic cleaner has a heater. If you are buying one, make sure you buy one that has a heater. They will clean way more effectively if the water is uh, warm. It doesn't need to be super hot, but this is, as I said, at about 50 degrees Celsius. Um, I use uh, distilled water, as I mentioned before, and then I mix it with a uh, substance that I buy. This is called Electro. Now, this is made by an Australian company, so if you're overseas, you probably won't be able to get this. But there is um, Branson EC, I think, um, I'm not sure, um, sort of, Jay, what detergent do you use over there? So, uh, but anyhow, this is a detergent that is specifically designed to dissolve things like dirt and grit and flux, specifically. Um, but it doesn't damage uh, the, uh, the UV coating and it doesn't damage the, uh, the solder, any of the metal components. So, this is, you know, this is a really good thing to have. You, you must be using a detergent. You know, you don't necessarily have to have this incredible crust of dust on top of the bottle. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's no harm in that. Um, so, yeah, as I say, this is, I'm going to need some more soon. But uh, you, you put, I think this is like one part of this to five parts water or something like that. Fill the thing up and then that's it. They ha it has a little basket in it. I'm going to stand up now and hopefully this lead reaches. I'm not wireless, I'm afraid, I'm cabled. So I'm just gonna just wander past the camera here and with a little bit of luck, you can still see me, hello. Um, so lift the lid off, you can't see inside it, I'm sorry, but it is basically just full of liquid. You might see a bit of steam coming off it there if it's in focus, which it probably isn't. And there's a little basket in here as well. Um, and the little basket is, makes it easier for pulling things out. And then I'm going to basically just clean this five minutes on each side. So I generally start on the bottom side, coming up that way, do that, and then I spin it over and do it the other way. Now, I normally do five minutes this one here because it's so gunky. I might actually do it a little bit longer on this side. But I'm just going to drop that into the liquid like this. Actually, you know what? This board is the size that's going to work better without the basket in there. So basket comes out, board goes in without basket, basket goes over here. And... Lid goes on and get ready for the beautiful noise of an ultrasonic cleaner working. So, now that we have that awful, horrible sound in the background, um, I'm going to finish off the stream because um, it's... Everyone lower your volume when he turns that thing on just to be safe, yeah. So, yes, I do apologise for that awful noise, um, but I will finish off the stream now. So, I wanted to say to everyone... Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you for hanging on for such a long time. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. If you haven't pressed the like button on the video, please, please press it. If you hated it, press the down button. I don't mind. Um, and um, uh, then, and I, uh, yeah, I mean, look, I'm fairly sure it'll work, but um, it, this certainly isn't going to be time to keep this stream going to uh, test it after that, because I've basically got to clean it dry it and then test it again so uh, I'll have to just sort of post it on I don't know something on my you know, sort of uh, probably on my Facebook or something like that I'll you know, if it works so thank you to everyone for hanging on um, what are we we've got 15 people sitting on at the moment so thank you to all of you and thank you to anyone else who watched and I will see you at the next stream